now. <laughs> right now. Right now. Right now. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello, Nubians, wherever you are in the world. Hi, Dr. Carr. Hey, Professor Hunter. How are you? Um, I'm vaccinated, but still wearing my mask because I got <laughs> issues and y'all nasty. <laughs> I, somebody, somebody posted on Twitter. I was like, I'm going to get that. I know that's right. Everybody is tripping. Why are people talking about virtue signaling? No, we can wear our masks. I mean, I'll have my mask on outside tomorrow. Uh, uh, Baba Jeremiah Wright is coming to town. Um, he usually preaches at Howard Chapel every uh, the Martin Luther King birthday weekend. But he has, well, I'm not going to say what he has or hasn't done. It was advertised that this is his retirement uh, sermon. So at, at least I guess at, at Howard. So he's preaching tomorrow outside his graduation season. So all the bleachers are up, the chairs up, thousands of seats, which they always need because he always packs the place and they have overflow when he's inside. And so he and Freddie Haynes, one of his sons in the ministry, and my good friend and brother too, um, is going to be preaching with him. They're doing two. I'm like, oh. So I text him. I said, you, you return? He said, well, from preaching Okay, we'll see. Because I mean, as erudite and brilliant as that elder is, I don't know that he or any other black person knows how to spell retirement. So, <laughs> I'm, but but my point is, I'll be out there with a mask on because it could be a super spreader event. And Howard has shut down all in-person classes. We're back online completely. And because we're trying to get through to graduation so people can come. So yeah, that shirt is entirely appropriate. If I had one, I might wear that on, wear that tomorrow. Although I, I expect black folk gonna have the sense to have masks. Yeah, we we know it. I mean, quietly, Boston is like, hey, uh, 65 percent up in cases. And yep. I think because people aren't being hospitalized, folk are getting through it. You know, it's not a thing. But like, I don't want that. Well, it's a good reminder, too. It's a good moment for us to remind. This is the front page of today's New York Times. Race to vaccinate the world loses momentum. Hmm. Of the only a few of the world's 82 poorest countries, including Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, and Nepal, have reached the 70% vaccination threshold. Because remember, they said they wanted the world wanted to have 70% of the people in the world vaccinated by June of this year. Mm. Well, that's not going to be the case. Many are under 20%. And I love this this sentence right here. It says, Now it is clear that the world will fall short of the target by the deadline, and there is a growing sense of resignation among public health experts that high COVID vaccination coverage may never be achieved in most lower income countries as badly needed funding from the United States dries up and both governments and donors turn to other priorities. In other words, F y'all. Yeah. Well, never, it was never going to shoot us up. <laughs> America has the, the where we want the funds to send to uh, war. Anyway, all right. No, 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 that's important. And again, we, we read Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King tells us, where do we go from here? Y'all got money for where the hell y'all want. And, and it's our money. We paid taxes. We just did, had another oh, round. Speaking of which, uh, tax season, y'all. Tax season. Yeah, we just, you know. But hey, give some more money so they can give it back to the people who got y'all out here organizing. Shout out to all the people who's organizing at Amazon. Apple is now. Look like it's anytime you see folks who have issues on culture and all this class come together organized labor seems to be going through a little bit of a of a, of a surge and some yeah. of that is because you know it's it's rough out here yeah well people you gotta put people first um today yeah. uh 111th episode i keep landing on the ones i keep looking up my clock is 11 11 or 111 one James yeah. Brown. yes i think that that they call that the angel number so we had 111 111 ones all the ones i i one think one. That protection and all of that. So I'm really happy that we are in the community today. It's April 23rd. Also, uh, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, <laughs> Boris Yeltsin died on this day. Oh, Boris Yeltsin, huh? Yeah. Uh, James, James Earl Ray also died on this day. I think it's ironic, you know, Russia. Mm. Uh, you got James Earl Ray, who uh, was convicted of assassinating Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. There are quotes. No not, question. Not in prison at in eight. William Pepper's book or on the subject uh, or um, Dick Gregory, I think, and Mark Lane wrote the first one on that. And of course, the King family, even Dexter in his book, Growing Up King, writes about that. They didn't believe it. That trial they had in Memphis before Joe Brown went off into that good night, wherever he is now, when he was actually sitting on a bench and not on TV, uh, presided over that trial. 
and the evidence, you know, it doesn't add up. Of course, it doesn't add up. But we know the state killed Martin. Joe, Joe Brown presided over that. He sure did. As, as a literal judge in Memphis. <laughs> this is before. Well, actually, it may have been uh, parallel with his TV stuff. But no, yeah, because Judge Joe Brown was a judge like Greg Mathis. Of course, he sat on the bench. And Mathis in Michigan and, and uh, Brown in Tennessee and Memphis in particular. So, yeah, he's, he actually presided over that trial. Uh, also, this day, uh, James Buchanan, 15th president, was born. Hmm. Shout um, out to that racist. Uh, yeah. James Buchanan, actually president before Lincoln, uh, actually was the president who kind of pushed forward the possibility of recognizing Haiti as uh, a country because they were planning on sending our black asses there. And of course, that's one thing he and Abraham Lincoln agreed on because Lincoln in his, as we know, compensated Emancipation Act that he signed that Congress passed. They set aside about $100,000. And so any of you Negroes in D.C. who we just bought your freedom, if y'all want to leave, uh, we got a ticket for you. Oh, and by the way, one other thing about Buchanan. Buchanan was president when uh, that ship we are reading about this month, the Clotilda came into uh, Mobile Bay. And in fact, uh, as we talked about Monday night, and if y'all are not in Nubia, I can't believe it's only been six months since Nubia bloomed. And now here we are with a thousand, I think we had like 11, close to 1,200 people Monday night. 1,300 on Monday. 1,300. Okay. See, the numbers kept shooting. I was in the in the conversation. I didn't see the number. But, but uh, Buchanan, under the Buchanan administration, the feds tried to tighten up regulation on the Gulf Coast, New Orleans, Mobile, um, because the Confederate, uh, well, soon to be Confederate, the white nationalists down there who had us enslaved were sending money and aid to Nicaragua, where they were propping up a coup d'etat that brought into power a general who said Nicaragua is now open for colonization. That was part of the steps that some of these white boys in the South had imagined that if they could just shake themselves of northern control, they could extend what eventually became the Confederate States of America all the way down through Latin America. In other words, they were just going to keep going south. And Nicaragua, they had a they had a government in place. And so what, what Buchanan and them boys knew, the feds knew, is that they were running ships all up and down the Gulf Coast, in the Gulf of Mexico anyway. So when the feds came in to try to regulate we saw an early iteration of what these anti-CRT people are talking about today and anti-abortion and all that states' rights because they were actually in Mobile, in New Orleans, in Biloxi, Mississippi. They were fighting in those local places to keep the federal government out of their business because they were planning, some of them, to expand the slaveocracy down through Central America. So as we're reading Barracoon, it just puts another context into uh, into the whole idea that they had to sneak a boat in the mobile. No, there were a lot of friendly ports because they were anti-federal. So anyway, I'm glad you mentioned James McCann because that never would have occurred to me. It's stunning how they keep their eye on the ball. No question. It's stunning how the planning never stops, which should be a message to us the planning never stops. They have one goal and they're going to figure out how to get there by any means necessary, even if it means putting a circus, whole circus ass clown in office. If it means okay. Who's going to put a judge on a bench or two or three who are going to do the bidding. They have never stopped keeping their eye on their ball. That's right. So, uh, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, what does the law mean? I know you probably covered it on, on the radio. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> I, I did have to pause for 10 minutes. It, it was it was foolishness Friday, and I didn't even deal with that foolishness. I mentioned it and kept going. Oh, okay. I just I watched about 10 minutes of her uh testimony when the lawyer had her all tripped up and said, You call Nancy Pelosi a traitor? She said, No. And then he said, Uh, let's go to exhibit four. Said, wait, 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 wait. I I, I mean, <laughs> like, but 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 the beautiful thing about it, and I saw some people on social media saying. Well, see, you know, this is how stupid they are. I said, no, y'all missing the point to your point on keeping the eye on the ball. This has nothing to do with intelligence. It has nothing to do with accuracy. It has everything to do with, I don't give a damn, full speed ahead. And so y'all keep making, let I me mean, not say y'all. I hate that when I see it on social media. Y'all, y'all, y'all. We, we often make the mistake of characterizing the behavior of zealots 
as if they have some investment in accuracy. No, there are no facts involved in this. Marjorie Taylor Greene is not supported because she's factually accurate. She's supported because she's a white nationalist. And so watching her on the stand yesterday and watching people say, see, we finally got her. You can never get them because y'all trying to play by rules. Rules? Yeah. It ain't no rules. <laughs> it ain't no rules. It is it. I had a little brief argument yet. Uh, was it yesterday? Day before yesterday, where Harry Harry Lennox, uh, our brother from Chicago, who just got a twenty six million dollar grant uh, from the state of Illinois to build out his cultural center there in the south side of Chicago, which is going to be amazing. Okay, so, how it. But, yes, uh, but we got into it because, you know, he's like, Will Smith should get back his uh, because it's the right thing to do. And I was like, what's the right thing to do? So you're telling me the Academy that had Hattie McDaniels not even in the arena to get her Oscar. Oh, to, to give her an Oscar for playing a role that they're so comfortable with. Mammy, uh, Halle Berry, the uh what's the name? Uh, Monique playing a horrible human being, Denzel, corrupt. I mean, that Academy, we're supposed to have some honor. Well, it's for, it's for what's right for him. And I'm like, mm. so those rules, are we supposed to play by some moral, ethical, do North? Well, it's for our, so I'm like, no, no, no. Well, that's interesting. No. But he wasn't, no. was he saying, does he believe they have rules? Or was he saying he want to play it by- It doesn't matter North. whether they have rules. We have a moral authority that we I have. And I, you know, as a man that was going to be a priest, I, I completely understand. Oh wow! You know his, uh, you know the way he moves in the world. He has a due north in himself. Mm. But I'm like, we, but the world we live in. And I'm not saying throw all the rules out. I'm just saying let's win. Uh, I'm trying. Mm. I think let's win. And if there are no rules, then we make our own, right? Don't we? Kind of like we we strategize, we figure it out, and then we change and shift accordingly. I'm just I don't know. It's tough. I mean, Cedric Robinson writes about that in Black Marxism when he um, says that the barometer by which African people created a kind of moral ground, what we would call in our African states framework, ways of knowing, he says it was one that, as a result of the Things we brought with us, our cultures, our various cultures, and then how those things had to blend together to oppose and resist this social structure, as we call it in the African States framework. As a result, there was a higher moral standard. We demanded more of ourselves. And often with students, uh, when I have them read Robinson's Black Movements in America, they'll often read it in tandem with Michael Gomez, exchanging our country marks. And Gomez makes a point that some of those Africans who were interviewed in the 1930s uh, for the Works Progress Administration, that last generation who had suffered enslavement, uh, were asked about how they came to be enslaved, what they had heard. You know, all of them, with the exception of a handful like Kasula, who we're reading about, of course, in Nubia, in, um, in reading Barracoon, all of these other folk, the vast majority, almost all of them, have been born in the United States. Many of them have, having been born in the United States and their parents, their parents' parents, so they had been here for some time. This is 1930s, as I said. And uh, in fact, there's a book called Long Past Slavery, which talks about the politics of those interviews. But because many of those interviews were done by white people, as we know, remember, we talked about Ophelia Egypt and Charles Johnson at Fisk. And that was one of the early times when this was black people. And you read those transcripts and they sound very different. They were talking to that young sister very differently than they talked to these white boys came to interview them. But anyway, long story short, to the point you raising with Harry Lennox in terms of this moral standard and this internal barometer that we will not sacrifice. And to Robinson's point that enslavement pressed together these various cultures and out of this came a way of knowing that had an elevated standard of responsibility and morals when they were interviewed and you look at these transcripts and and, and, and michael gomez writes about this again and it's changed in our country march they said well how did y'all get here and they had tell all these stories about capture about subterfuge about tr being tricked about the king buzzard and the ships and all this in you know, metaphors for this enslavement process and um, and we'll talk all about a lot of this next week, uh, next Monday, this coming Monday, when we look at the first seven sections of Barracoon, because we see it personalized in terms of Kasula Lewis, 19 years old when he was taken. And after the inter as the interviews go on, these white interviewers ask what white people always ask. 
as Holly Grima often says, you know, the reason you almost have always had to have a white character in a Hollywood movie with black people is because white people need to see themselves. Where do I fit in this? Where's the point of entry for me? So, of course, the interviewers say, well, what did y'all think of the white people involved? Gomez notes that these black interviewees over and over again would say, well, we didn't think about them. And when pressed, well, well why not? White interviewers, well, what about us? Well, why not? The response, well, that's just what white people do. Hmm. So the whole idea that we have a standard <laughs> that expects, because, because part of the narratives convey this sense of betrayal. You didn't even look like us. I was hurt by, you know what I'm saying? Like, what about white people? What? We wasn't thinking about what? Because all of their experience, these enslaved, formerly enslaved Africans in the 1930s, their parents, their parents' parents, all their experience with white people was, that's what y'all do. Now, you know, to add a little Catherine Hayes car into that, as my mama will always say, you know, white folks do what they want to do. And that ties to your point. <laughs> so, Harry, <laughs> I understand the moral standard, brother. That's very noble because that's what we do. That's what Martin Luther King said. But please understand, white folks do what they want to do. Him giving that statue back ain't gonna make that no easier for you to get a contract to get a deal. It ain't gonna it ain't gonna make them the light come on and them to say, "Oh, you right, Harry." You know, I don't know what we were thinking about for these past five hundred years. You are absolutely right. This little statue changed my whole worldview, bruh. You do you, because white folks gonna do what they want. To do. <laughs> anyway, I mean, you know, and to his point though, it was like it's for his soul. Okay. Okay. Um. Respect. Yes. Yes, you know, we often have this, you know, um, this this conversation, this internal conversation as well. Like, you know, we're better than that. I've heard you say this a lot. We're better sure. than that. You're like, who's we? Who's and you know, please show me the evidence. But, you know, I do believe a lot of us believe we're better than that, which is why we operate. We'll, we'll turn our our brothers and sisters in. We'll, you know, we'll 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 do a lot of things to show them that we are morally better than they think we are but the reality is that's flipped as the as you just pointed out we're dealing with moral bankruptcy but we're trying to please see us as more it it is it is a, a um it is a an ever chasing we will never catch up because you're chasing something that doesn't exist in the natural so 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 what do we do I mean, well, I mean uh, let, let me give you a quick example because I would never. Oh, work yeah, with us. All right, go ahead. No, no, no. I know this, and this is where we're going with it because this is what you listen, y'all. What we're doing today, I don't know. I was sitting somewhere grading papers because it is that time of year, graduation senior, graduating senior grades, and all that stuff. And I got a, 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 a ping from Karen Hunter, and we talked yesterday for a few minutes. And what she's about to unveil sent me down a hole. I'm moving books around here. And one of the books I thought I had put in storage, I hadn't even thought about it, frankly, because I had most of my sports biographies are in storage, was this little book here, OJ, The uh -huh. Education of a Rich Rookie. <laughs> now, why would I bring an OJ Simpson book up and what we about to talk about and what we just, uh, what you just mentioned? Well, I thought it was interesting. This is what OJ says. Let me see if I could find it quickly. Can we quote OJ? On well, I mean, here's the thing. Well, I mean, OJ is a 21-chapter book. Of course, it's co-written. And he's talking about what he wants to do for black people. O.J. Simpson just finished his rookie year. And, he, and the first chapter is called A Question of Image, right? This is what O.J. Simpson says. Needless to say, my popularity has also been a key to my financial success. This is his first year. He, he, he just finished his first year. In fact, this book was published in 1970. He says, I'm well aware that others have run just as fast and far without ever earning a fraction of the endorsement money I made in the last year. I'm thinking about that Magic Johnson documentary just came out on TV. I just started watching it this morning. Very interesting. I, I you know, I know you want, I really want to hear what you think about this, this one. Uh, I'm it's particularly in, in, in con, uh, contrast with winning time or whatever. I'm also aware that I have been accused of playing the establishment game, trying to get important people to like me in order to further my career. That just isn't true. I'm enjoying the money, the big house, the cars, what ghetto kid wouldn't. But I don't feel that I'm being selfish about it. In the long run, watch this, in the, this 1970, in the long run, 
I feel that my advances in the business world will shatter a lot of white myths about black athletes and give some pride and hope to a lot of young blacks. And when I'm finished with the challenges of football, I'm going to take on the challenge of helping black kids in every way I can. I believe that I can do as much for my people in my own way as a Tommy Smith, a Jim Brown, or a Jackie Robinson may choose to do in another way. That's part of the image I want too. Now, y'all might always throw that in the trash. I guarantee you <laughs> that probably, well, this is a, a space we have now. And of course, with Nubia now just being a little over six months old and COVID shifting the our, our vision so we can glimpse the power of uh, study stripped from access and stripped from false validation for saying, well, you didn't go to university. No, no, no. All that COVID wiped that away. And now we're building with clear vision. So yeah, we might, some, I expect that a lot of people would know what I just read, but the vast majority of people in this social structure in the world had no idea that OJ Simpson started that way, which leads me back to the question that, that, that you provided a, a, a beautiful metaphor for yesterday. The question I just asked you, which is what do we do when we are in a society where by all account, this cat started off with good intentions. Mm -hmm. But that social structure, you understand that social structure, which advances you if you can run and pitch and hit a jump shot or swing a, a bat. And now you're in the public eye and the social structure. And then you've got all these folks in the governance structure looking at you like, okay, they like you because you run fast. What you going to do for the people? And there was a time, and you and I both remember it, although we were very young. In fact, if we remember it at all, we remember it because this was the point. When black celebrities and black athletes were expected to do something for the black community. And the question that we raised then is, why? Why? Why were they expected to do anything? Because clearly even Orenthal James Simpson said, I believe I can do as much for black people as Jackie Robinson did, as James Brown, uh, Jim Brown is doing. You know, I could do as much for black people. Irvin Johnson, I, I can do opening Magic Johnson theaters, you know, trying to, you know, go into business and employ black people and calling meetings between the Crips and the Bloods and make sure that we're trying to build some stuff around. We're going to get everybody a job. Why are you doing that? Man, I grew up in Lansing, Michigan. My daddy didn't miss a day of work in his life. My mom prayed for me every day. I got a big family. We all came working class. You think I'm just out here dribbling basketballs, bro? I mean, but but I mean, come on, come on back, Karen, because in asking these questions, you, 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 what you said yesterday really shook me and sent me all rumbling through here. And that's why I unearthed this OJ bio. Look up for something else. But go ahead. <laughs> what, I mean, you know, I just well, it was a couple of things that happened, you know, CNN grand opening, grand closing, CNN plus streaming platform. And I was like, I, I have said many, many times, they scramble every day to get a million people to view your cable outlet. Mm. If there's no war, which is why you see breaking news around the clock war. Cause that's, that's, the, that's the algorithm y'all. That's the algorithm. That's the thing that keeps mm -hmm. it going. But those nighttime shows barely crack a million viewers. Why did you think you could launch a streaming platform and then spend $300 million. What nobody trying to go over there to watch Chris Wallace? Like, <laughs> really, you know, I mean, Chris Wallace couldn't get a million people over at Fox. So I'm like, okay, y'all, $300 million y'all poured into a streaming platform that didn't last a month. Wow. Then the Obamas. Uh, oh, you know, yes. The Obamas, you know, we love them. Um, not feeling, I'm not feeling Viola playing, mm -hmm. you know, not feeling that, but you know, yeah, I ain't got no I love, I love Viola. I love her. So I'll just say I that. love Viola Davis too. But I mean, why did they put anyway? I don't know. I don't know. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, yeah, we, it. This was yesterday's times that you said CNN's venture into streaming ends abruptly. Yo, three weeks. Yeah, I asked you about okay. Yeah, why did they think that? Pro? Uh, okay, let's let's get that. And, and I think this actually hopefully will reveal for us. The power of us more than anything no question come so, on now okay so that happened the obamas big name big name big name 
Spotify, they, they no longer be with Spotify, right? And so the stories are written different ways, but there's no way in hell Spotify would let them go if they were bringing traction. There's no way. Oh, interesting. They held on to Joe Rogan. Like, they were like, I don't care, nothing to see here. He <laughs> say the N-word. Okay, we'll remove those N-word things, but this motherfucker brings in like 100 million Word. people. Like, we, mm, mm. Word. Word. Spotify was like, no, we don't talk about Joe. No, no, no. We're not talking about this. Maybe it'll die down. Maybe people will forget. And they did, right? But they did not let Joe Rogan go. Everybody's like, I'm quitting Spotify. Barbara's, uh, everybody and their mother who's on there. I'm pulling all my stuff off. Spotify was like, mm, 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 mm. Whatever. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but the Obamas, they were, oh, well, they're going to, they're shopping another deal with other players. And I was like, no, they didn't get any traction. Who was listening to it? Oh, so you that was spin the whole idea that they have these other options and they want they don't want exclusivity. They didn't have the numbers. So I saw all this to say. Um come, come I, said this to you yesterday. I said well, also, also I do want to ask too, in terms of one other big story that broke this week, the Netflix collapse. Were you surprised by that? No, I mean I feel two ways about it. Hmm. You know, we are sustained for the next five years off of the people we have right now in Nubia narrative. Which like is the plan point. that way. Yes. CNN couldn't get 10,000 people, right? After spending 300 million. Wow. I'm, I'm laughing because, you know, here we sit, right? Here we sit. We, we sit here firmly in Nubia right now. I'm in the chat. Hi, y'all. I'm Ujasaneb to everybody, too. Mm, come on now. Um. With with a vision, like I told you, day one, I'm I'm going to commit 20 years of my life to build this thing out. But we good for the next five years. We good no matter what happens. Governance, governance. me, And in six months to have gone as far as it is. And those of you who are not yet in, like you said, it's not ain't nobody pitching, campaigning. This is governance. And it's interesting on one end of the spectrum, the CNN pluses, the B, uh, the BNCs, Black News Channel, the 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 Netflix, the Spotify on the on the other end. If you've got anybody with a device and an ability to upload YouTube, it's a billion different things coming up, TikTok, all this. But the key, I think, was COVID in the sense that when when everybody was locked down and you had a moment to have attention and everybody was speaking, what emerged? Now, we know ball players are seen as spokespeople for the race because they have platform. That's why even when the L.A. insurrection went down, they said, Magic, where's Magic? We got to get Magic. Somebody... But, Magic is a ball player. He don't know nothing about no, no, but everybody knows him. What emerged out of COVID, first of all, with the implosion of higher education. Let's be clear about that. We've talked about it before. I'm not gonna talk about it again now. Those price points cannot be sustained with the with the denting of the illusion that elite economic elites, cultural elites, political elites somehow structure a society. You should listen to them because you can see them with the erosion of that. What has he was emerging in Nubia and not just Nubia, but what has emerged? Because we see the same thing even with Masterclass. We talked about that months ago. Y'all gonna put some out black, blow, and I see some of this other stuff out blow. I'm looking at that stuff like, yeah, but for about a year, when everybody was locked down, people had a moment to reflect on the fact that we all have brains, we all have access, and that that was a false valuation. And so what what is emerging now is you're describing Nubia and what we're you know what we're building and narrative and all the the, the 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 people who are coming and just continue to come. That's governance. We are with each other, and and it only took a moment of stop everything. Wait, everything stop? Yeah, everything. No one come. No, everything. <sighs> okay, let me look here. Oh, I like that. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, I can wait. Hold on. I ain't got to pay $60,000 or $50,000 or $30,000 a year. No. I ain't got to get up and argue with people about my child's teacher all the time. Yes, you probably do that still, but you can learn more here and go back. Shout out to Craig Robinson and his wife. They pulling their children from this expensive $30,000 a year private school no, in Milwaukee. They pulling their children. Their children got kicked out. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, they did. Got kicked out, right? And that explains oh, Wait a minute. You want us to do what now? Oh, Y'all could go. Y'all could go. Because we got our eye on the ball. Come on. And this is a on the ball private schools. If you know anything about the history of education in the United States of America, particularly private education, you know that the Phillips Exeters of the world and they go all the way back to the Harvards and the King's College, now Columbia University. And that after 1954, they're mushroomed in this country. 
all these private academies where they can teach white ass supremacy. And the question I would ask is, number one, why you why you want your child over here in the first place? But you know what? That's a personal decision. No problem. You're going to send your child to be a shock troop. No problem. But when they get crushed or they get assaulted intellectually and culturally, and then you come into the media and say, you know, this is OK. Yeah. Fight that fight. But guess what? While you, while we fight that fight, what y'all doing? We pouring clean glasses of water because clearly y'all don't need in the words of Malcolm X. You speak in a language they don't understand in the words of, of uh, the elders who talked to them white people in the 1930s. White folk. Oh, yeah. We wasn't thinking about them. That's what they do. We pouring clean. glass. Why are you wasting your time? But what you're describing in terms of what we're doing now. This is not controlled by anybody but us. And that's why it's attracting. And so, you know, at the at the key, as we talk about governance, who we are to each other, we were, cre this notion of blackness was created out of a resistance, but then what else is it? Which is why I was intrigued yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the context of what you saying that now, now, please continue. Cause I mean, cause I'm thinking, you, you started thinking about blackness and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> well, go ahead and say this. <laughs> I mean, we were talking, Howard French told us, you know, and it, it it hit me like a ton of bricks when he did that Mansa Musa conversation. And then we had it in Nubia. We had it twice in Nubia with him. Tanya Pinkins came and she she called to order because that's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, look, I got some questions. I just came back from this area. I I read his book and I don't know. So I was like, all right, let's bring him in, let's have a conversation. And then we brought him back. But as he was talking about it, I'm like, the whole damn world is built on the ingenuity of blackness. Period. Hmm. Full stop. Hmm. Why don't we know that? Hmm. You, you asked me about Netflix. 221 million subscribers, Dr. Carr. 221 million subscribers. I'm not worried about them. But the question is, where's their ingenuity? Right. They're relying on people coming in. They bought up a lot of licenses. So they were underwater financially the first, I think, decade, huh. you know, because they went out and bought up everything so that they could have content. Mm -hmm. But the content creators and I'm like, I'm talking, I talked yesterday to Courtney B. Vance. So we talking Lovecraft Country. We talking, we talking all of the, you know, underground and that same Mich Misha Green. Mm -hmm. Where is she? Like, so if if we had. And, and this is going to take a minute. So we got to have patience. And I know like Nubians are like ready to like, let's let's rule the world right now. And I'm like, the world isn't built. That pyramid at Giza took 20 years, which is why mm -hmm. I gave myself this time. Right. Breathe. But remember who you are. Tap into the thing that you have been given away, that has been stolen from you, that you are just making other things great. Y'all at work doing the jobs of five people. Ask yourself why. Ask yourself when you quit, why did they hire three people to replace you? Oh, Ask yourself that. Ask yourself all of the great ideas that you give out for free. Ask yourself why we make Twitter hot, TikTok hot with our dances and everything. Ask yourself, these companies now are valued at X amount of billions of dollars off of, again, black ingenuity. Mm, mm, mm. So I, I, I posed the question yesterday and, you know, I've been thinking about this, of course, quite deeply. You know, the one thing that I think that has come out as we read Kasula's journey and we read all of the things that we're reading in Nubia and narrative, um, they created whiteness, had a meeting, divvied up a continent, <laughs> dispersed blackness all over the globe to build empires. Hmm. But what they gave us in that was blackness. Why are we running away from that? Are we? Some people. We shouldn't call ourselves black. I'm foundational. They not this. I'm not that. that oh, oh, yes, absolutely. We are. I, that person, I'm not you. I'm I'm black American. You're I'm like, but they didn't make a distinction when they got in that room. They did not. And they do not. So why are we? But more importantly, they gave us a gift. Because now, now we look, and I sat. I watched. I was on. I uh, watched Bloomberg TV uh, the other night, and there's there's a black woman CEO, billionaire, founder, first black founder of a of an electric car company. And I sat there and watched that interview, and I was like, "How don't I know her? Why am I just seeing this?" And how do it free us? I'm I don't sure. know. Is she, I don't we got to ask her. You got to ask her. You going? I'm sure you are gonna track her down and ask. I her. am. But <laughs> you know, like, even that, the, like the conversation we had with Howard French, I think it was like uncomfortable for him. And then he was like, "Well, wait a minute, this is different." I think every time we tap somebody, because you know, just like you read from the the book with OJ, the book of OJ, the in his mind, he felt like 
he was doing something, right? I'm I'm helping. He felt, I'm, like, he felt like he could do something in the future because right. that was the that was the for in the he hadn't done it yet. And now we now we got what is that 1970? Now we got 52 years of evidence. <laughs> I mean, that's a hell of a thing. And I mean, you think about here's a kid who says, This is what I want. I want to be like Jackie Robinson. 52 years later, if he opens his mouth, <laughs> it's like he's a punchline. Yeah. Well, Cosby the same. There was that murder and stuff, though. That well, yeah. But, 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 but I'm saying, even before the murder, how did you end up in that situation right. in the right. first place? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What happened between 1970 and 1990? <laughs> before you. you <laughs> But that's what the, the system is designed to absorb you into. There's the point. There's so, the point. So my, my thing is the call that's to action is to not be absorbed up in it into mm -hmm. it. And even those of us who think we're sitting and we are uh you know, well, we're we're spooked to sat by the door. So we, I'm gonna get that check, I'm gonna sit there Jeez. on this chair, I'm gonna make this deal, I'm there, but no I'm really looking out for my people. You I'm can never look out man. their eyes on the ball. <laughs> and that ball requires you to be absorbed into the system. So you're not you're you're not liberating us or yourself, and you may get a nice check. You may get a nice check. Oh, you want to get a nice check. But the but the plan has been strategically orchestrated. Um, exactly. no matter who you are. So I, I feel like we first have to know that. And so this is part of the journey that we've been on 111 episodes on this right. journey to remember. Uh, but then we have to be really proactive and as vigilant and on the ball as they are with the mission. But we also have to be clear about what that mission is, because I think we have 50, 11 different missions. 50, yeah. 11, because the only thing holding us together is, is a label. Right. That label has to mean something. It means something to them. Yeah. It means so much to them. They are willing to storm the Capitol, tear up the country, kill everybody in, in sight to hold on to this thing called whiteness. They're willing to do. All. What are we willing to do? What are we willing and who who is the we that's willing to do it? That's right. That's how it writes. You know, I mean, Europe created itself by hitching a piggyback ride onto Africa into the Western Hemisphere, uh, decimating the, the human beings who were here in terms of indigenous people, and then using that labor and ingenuity to construct a world system. And that system is coming apart now. The radical inequality, even as the New York Times front page today says that COVID's not. You know, the vaccine isn't everywhere and that the poorest countries that have maybe as as few or a fifth of the people vaccinated or not. The question becomes also uh, that they're asking, well, how come the whole continent of Africa isn't ravaged by COVID? The answer includes diet, includes so much that happens outdoors in terms of daily life of African people. Sun, the sun. Sun includes so many of these things. And now, of course, the African people of the Western Hemisphere, particularly in the United States, who do not live in those same conditions. See, black people can't get it. Okay, everybody slow down. That label black you're using, you you're using it incorrectly. You haven't you haven't thought about it. You just assuming it because we all look alike, we're all in the same circumstances. That simply isn't true. Oh, and people love saying this. The black community is not a monolith. Okay, you realize the absurdity of that statement, right? Well, it's not absurd. Yeah. What community did you say? The black. Black. You're using that monolithically? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I mean, you don't know what you mean. <laughs> you, said, you said the black community is not a monolith, but you use the monolith to say it's not a monolith. That's a that's the definition of an oxymoron. <laughs> that's an oxymoronic phrase. However, I think we all know what is meant when we say that. What we're saying is that it's not enough to have a demographic label to talk about a common objective, sense of objectives, a common set of cultures. Right. I mean, so shake out the joke in a little book he wrote near the end of his life called Black Africa, the basis for a federated state. Shake out the joke, the Senegalese scholar born in Jorbel, Senegal, December 1926, who spent his adult life researching and thinking about those connections that Tanya bore witness to in the Nile Valley and then came and, and engaged in conversation critique, analysis, exchange with Howard French around where do we start this concept of blackness? Shake on to Job, who unearthed the fact that there's a lot more cultural continuity among African people than there is dissimilarity. In another set of texts that he wrote, uh, 
um, one of which was hacked into several books, his doctoral dissertation, he had to write two because they wouldn't pass him in France. They're like, this is absurd. The Africans uh, were, the Egyptians were Africans? Yeah, uh, we can't. Okay, I'll write another one. Well, part of one of those theses was developed into a book called The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. Uh, black Nations and Culture, Nations Negres et Culture in French was kind of like the, the major piece that came out of it. And then the African Order of Civilization became the first piece of those dissertations that was published, uh, translated still on the continent share. But we can't, we, not we can't, we have not yet had or taken or seized the time and space to turn down the noise of this social structure as we use in the Arcan space framework to explore this conversation with ourselves. We have not yet broken the chain, to use the metaphor of Jacob Carruthers, that link African ideas to European ideas and speak to our ancestors without interpreters. We haven't done it. So when people say, well, black community is not a monolith, or, you know, we talking about it, those people don't know us. I mean, you are speaking as if you have studied this. You have not studied this. You haven't even imagined it. The minute you begin to imagine it, that sense of possibility can be absolutely frightening because the social structure that we live in has been constructed precisely to stop you from imagining it. And if you even, uh, you know, as Richard Pryor once said, you know, in terms of boxing, you know, if you even dream about a possibility of Africans connecting, uh, you better wake up and apologize. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> don't even do, and anybody you see doing that, we've been trained to excoriate. Oh, I said, oh, whatever. Meanwhile, Europe, an imaginary concept. White people, an imaginary concept. Somehow, form like Voltron when it comes time to keep this criminal enterprise going. Yes, they are Russian. Yes, they're Ukrainian. Yes, they are English. Yes, they are uh, French. Yes, they are uh, Americans in terms of the United States. But somehow, when it comes to you, they are of one accord. The European Union, the international community. You're not part of the international community. You are part of the world. You live in a world, but that world is organized around power and power at the center of power so many times, unfortunately, I don't care whether it's Samuel Huntington or Joel Kotkin or, or uh, what's the white boy out of, uh, mm, it'll come to me in a minute, Neal Ferguson, or I mean, you start naming them over and over again, or those who want to be white because they can't do it with their skin, so they do it with their culture, Dinesh D'Souza, shout out to Dinesh D'Souza, all of these folk, you know, uh, or the one who's orchestrating it, who's got the baton now, one of the ones with the baton now, the disheveled Steve Ban uh, Bannon who, you know, is somewhere imagining this empire extending itself for another generation, which blew my mind the other day when I heard that uh, CPAC uh, is having its convention, you you know, here in D.C. Is, wait, Hungary? Is that true? Did you see that? I didn't. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us. They leaving. CPAC, you know, the, the, the annual white nationalist convention rally. Uh you know, and I don't know if they're going to pay for a ticket for Madison Cawthorn now that he's been exposed with all this stuff. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe they will. I mean, because again, your point, they keep their eye on the ball. You understand? <laughs> so I, I, I'm saying all that as a prelude to, to, to you raised you raised this, this phrase yesterday that sent me into the archive looking for things because I had been focusing in between grading papers on continuing to assemble from what I have here. And I'm still looking for a couple of pieces. I hope I didn't put in storage. Uh, related to Barracoon. And we're going to talk about that in a second because those of you who are who are not in Nubia, you really are missing a Barracoon that was really required by the group. Uh, the, this text that we're reading now and we'll be reading for the next three weeks, this Monday and then two Mondays after it, is really a tether, a guide to how we got here got here to the point where we have to talk about a we, but in terms of what you raised in terms of black and what is black, the, the, the idea is that white changes, that Europe changes, that the notion of the West changes, but that those are artificial concepts that are populated with meaning when it comes down to maintaining this world system that was built on these concepts. And so there is a whole world out there who is operating in ways that don't center that concept. So that while we're having this conversation, the Chinese are like, 
And because this and this is the thing I love. One of the things I love about Howard French, French's new book, Born in Blackness, has introduced him to a whole new readership. And we are uh, I'm very happy. Of course, we talked about this, too. Ken. We're very happy to be part of that because because of covid. Because everybody hunkered down, because this this room, this work right here, connecting with work people have been doing all along and are continuing to do as we build re, and, and connect and strengthen this network of people who have been working all along. Things like a book that would normally perhaps not have been visible to a lot of people, uh, to our people, is now visible. And how French has a whole new audience to write with. But prior to Born in Blackness, even though he has spent decades traveling the world, much of the time in Africa and they his previous major books were on China, China and Africa, everything under the heavens, China on itself, and his book, China, und everything under the heavens, Howard just acknowledges and, and kind of charts what we know about China. They ain't never centered Europe because China isn't just a country, it's a civilization, it's a society, it's a cultural society. So when Sheikh Anta Joe writes, as early as 1947 or 48, when he put together a bunch of essays when he was a student in France, he's from Senegal, but he, he, wrote, uh, he wrote a little book called When Can We Speak of an African Renaissance? Mm. He carried that through his intellectual work, spent his life as an Egyptologist, as a physicist, as a chemist, as someone who said, I can demonstrate the cultural basis for blackness and continuity and connectivity. I can demonstrate the physical, the chemical and biological background, which is why he tested skin from ancient Egyptians showing that they were in fact black in terms of epidermal, the, the, the epidermis, their skin, their dermis rather, their skin. And when he asked for just a few little micrometers of skin from the royal mummies or Saku, he was rejected by the French. No, hell no. Because we know what you're going to find. They, these are black people. We don't need that kind of beef. Now, fast forward to 2022, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, of course, has the African statues now paired with the Egyptian statues. They've conceded the point. And at the center of the Mets exhibit, you know who they credit? Shake onto Jope. So when you go to the Met, you know see? Yeah, because of the work of Shake onto Jope. Yeah, it ain't just Shake onto Jope. You know who carried that ball? The Africans of the diaspora, which is why the only trip Shake onto Jope made outside, uh, well, coming to the United States. He obviously been all over the world, but when he came to the United States, he came in 1984 to Morehouse College, got an honorary degree. Andrew Young, Curtis Scott King, so many other people were there. Ivan Van Sertima, so many others were there. And he said, you know, it was the Africans of the diaspora who grasped the importance of some notion of global black connectivity and it was you who had promoted my work because i can't even get it promoted in senegal to this day the university the major university in senegal the university of dakar changed its name to university of sheikh onto joke and still at the university of sheikh onto joke they don't teach egyptian hieroglyphs but if you're in nubia you can take egyptian hieroglyphs from a student of the protege the Benga, of sheikh onto joke who was in the room when Joe and Obenga took on all the Egyptologists, the best in the world, the United Nations in 1974, they had a conference on who are these black, who are these people in ancient Egypt? Joe and Obenga said they were black. The other Egyptologists were like, well, we don't know. And then they used language. They used a physical uh, record. They used a material record. And Joe and Obenga, these two, Joe and Obenga took on the whole, the best Egyptologists in the world. And at the end, they didn't call a truce. You know what those other people said? They said, well, uh, there was a real lack of preparation and we were not prepared. To... I thought this whole meeting was about this. No, we stripped y'all neck and left you with your lies. Well, anyway, uh, you can't even take Egypt. You can't take Egyptian language at the university name for Sheikh Under Joke, but you could take it in Nubia with a student of one of the two men who were in that room. So understand having obliterated this notion of elite hierarchy and access to education, we now are building and pouring our clean glasses of water, which of course brings us right to the point that you're raising um, in terms of who we are. Sheikh Ida Joe was also a politician and he wrote this little volume near the end of his life where he says, Black Africa, the basis for a cultural basis for a federated state. So what he says is culturally, we are different from each other, but there are also similarities. And that's something we can build on politically. These artificial lines these colonizers drew, 
that you just mentioned, Karen, the, 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 the Treaty of Berlin and uh, the, the Partition of Africa, 1884, 1885, says, you know, you can maintain them if you want, but we can have regional cooperation and we can build a concept of connectivity. And then he says, with that concept of connectivity, here are the political implications, but here are the economic implications. And then in this little book, Sheikh Anta Job then says, here are all the material resources on the continent for which we don't need to look anywhere else. And I think about this sister you saying now, she's got, she's the CEO, billionaire of this company. Sheikh Anta Job writes, in the cultural unity of, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Black Africa, the cultural basis for a federated state, he says, there shouldn't be an automobile on the continent of Africa that is manufactured with anything that isn't in the continent of Africa. Do you know most of the continent is made of iron? Mm -hmm. so we shouldn't have any, <laughs> Man, the rubber is in the Congo. Do you know the oil, the petrol? In fact, we should be exporting cars to everywhere else and we can create new technology now. If you've been paying attention again to the world beyond uh, Carthorne and Rudy Giuliani on the mass singer, then you understand that lad, this very week in Mexico, uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, and the Mexicans have nationalized the lithium mines. You know, uh, um, uh, Mexico is like the second largest producer of lithium in the world. I forget who the first one is. I'm trying to remember. Um, or maybe it's not the first one. Maybe. Oh, oh, right, right, right. We talked about that. Uh, what's that place the Russians invaded? Oh, Ukraine. Anyway, point is this. You know what lithium is for? That's for electric batteries. <laughs> you understand? Now, check on the joke. If he were here, he would say, okay, does Africa have any lithium? You damn right we got lithium. The point is this. The next wars in the world will be like the previous wars in the world. They're going to be about resources. It's going to be water. It's already water. It's also going to be lithium. So if you're a billionaire sister on top of a company manufacturing stuff, well, the question is, how do we free us? Are you making deals with Africa? And people say, well, they ain't going to help us in the diaspora. Exactly. It's not going to help us in the diaspora unless those African countries are connected to countries in the Caribbean and to black populations in the United States. Say, That's crazy. Yeah, you even dream about that. You better wake up and apologize. Okay, you clearly aren't paying attention to who owns the mineral rights in Congo. And here's a hint. One of the cities that some of those folks live in, the initials are T-A. Oh, what the hell? Tel Aviv. The point is this. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this. People, as John Henry Clark, you say, always come to Africa for something they don't want to pay for and something they think they can't live without. The first thing they came to Africa for, that's the two people we have in this conversation this morning. <laughs> and then as Howard French tracks, they get the rest out. Now, so then... As you say, uh, Prof, since we were pulled into this, can we do something with it? So when you say blackness is a gift, it is a potential gift. Sheikh Anta Joe is saying we can do this, but we need to tone the noise down and begin to talk to each other and, and connect with each other. China looking at Africa like, please don't do that for another 50 to 100 years. By the time you hmm. get, then we will have it together. Right? I mean, you're taking whole villages of Chinese and dumping them in Namibia, in Angola. And you know what I'm saying? And, and, and the laughter I always had with my Nigerian friends, whether they be Yoruba or Bibio or Ibo or Hausa or Fula, you know, the whole joke for years was China is invading Africa, but they can't never invade Nigeria because them Negroes is crazy. <laughs> China's in Nigeria. So the point is this, <laughs> while everybody else is continuing this work, two or three Negroes getting in an in a NBA draft, uh, a cat saying, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman, having Negroes do the jangle leg at the Super Bowl halftime show, that don't do nothing. That's a blackness that is useless. In fact, it's not useless. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's a blackness that is useless to us, to any concept of us. It is very useful to the group that forms like Voltron, because as you say, they never take their eye off the ball. So as we're, um, as we're thinking about the possibility of what is black, of asking can black be untethered? Can black overflow the boundaries that have been set for it? Uh, can black assemble? You issued a call yesterday. Well, you ain't issue it yet, but you said it to me, and it just sparked my imagination. 
Do you mind sharing that with everybody else? We were talking about blackness yesterday. You, you said something. You share it. No. You said in terms of thinking and building together, you you said we should do something on black. Come on. Oh, you're going to make me say it. Karen Hunter, y'all, Karen Hunter told yesterday, we talking, after you kind of narrated how it would look, and you said, we should double down on black. Double down on black. Yes, we should. As we are understanding what black is, we should double down on it. But we shouldn't double down on the black that was given to us as a label. That looks like praising the OJ Simpsons because they can run. That looks like praising the LeBron James because they can run. That's like praising the Serena Williams because they can hit a ball or the Venus Williams because they can hit a ball. That's the black. You doubling down on that. You know what you doubling down on? Continuing to export your ingenuity. And in fact, um, please, come on. <laughs> I, I, I sit in a, in, in a unique position, you know, as someone who could have very easily uh, been co-opted into this thing. Uh, and but got a peek behind the curtain, mm -hmm. and then I was like horrified, and then I, you know, got angry, and then I got blackballed, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, right, they right. <laughs> give you a black ball. <laughs> yeah, oh, wait a minute, wait, I'm not. Oh, shoot, okay, I y'all trying to not make allow me to eat. Oh, all right, all right, because you, you feel that I'm a threat. So then I had to, you know, regroup and then see something. You know, because many of us don't get to see something play out. And what would happen if I was unapologetic and if I doubled down on us, feeding mm. us, mm. us, being in community with us? What would happen? You write that down. And so, and, and just so you know, I everything that, it, you know, has been sitting here. So it, it is organic. I don't, I'm not, you know, it's not a speech. You know, I'm not sitting there. I don't have like a, a, a thing that I'm going to go out and talk about to people, but I, I've been able to sit in this space long enough to know that when we are fed, when we are led, properly led, meaning, you know, allowed to go down rabbit holes. Somebody was like, you know, well, just tell us. And I'm like, no, we're going to drop breadcrumbs. Right. Pick them up, chew right. on them. You the only know, way to do it. Nourish yourself. All That's right. Right. Here's a rabbit hole. Go down it. That's right. We're going to lead you because we we need all of us. And I, and I think, you know, I was I was in community with Sam in the Nubias yesterday. Sam Reynolds, we were doing a, a astrology yeah. thing. You know, we're both in our in our season. And there's going to be two eclipses during Taurus for the first time. Oh, what? One on the 30th, one uh, May 14th, 15th. And that, that, that eclipse comes with power. And he talked about the Egyptians and how, you know, they some would put people in power during an eclipse and then execute them afterwards because they wanted to harness that power, but they didn't want that person to, to keep that power. You know, they just wanted to harness it. But I was, I was thinking about all of that. And I said, in, in my, in my spirit, I've watched us come together. I mean, you look at Monday night, you know, Chief Lewis and, and uh, Lewis, my man. the woman that came in and I'm, I apologize for forgetting her name, but had us all in tears when she talked about being snatched away from her mother days old and not knowing who she was. Tanisha. But, Tanisha, thank you, thank you, thank you. Tanisha thank you. with those given computers. And we had seen Tanisha. Tanisha been all over the place giving out, but, but that moment? Oh. That moment. And, ooh, and, ooh. And, but she made that connection to Kasula. She but sure I don't know did. did. She made the connection to all of us. Yes, she did. All our, our people snatched from a place that we don't know for sure, for sure. But in our spirit and our DNA, we know for sure, for sure. My God. It's that knowing that we got to every day get up and know. Not just, you know, verbally. We built this country. You know, we say that. Nah, oh, that, that, that Obama that. will say, you know, I live in a house built by slaves. Nah, we did. Don't do that. You know that, though. And what does that mean? And what's required of you to know that? And, and she so, didn't even know that in 1814, some of them same Africans told the British how to burn the damn house. Come on, Michelle. Tell it all. I got, I got, I mean, I'm going African to some all right You know, I ain't, got, I ain't got a whole lot of love for them, too. I know. Africana studies major at Princeton. But uh, can you be yeah, that? It just goes to show you, doesn't it? Is that an moron, Dr. Carter, to be an Africana studies major at Princeton? 
Um, oh well, you know, I mean, you can't. Hey, look, shout out to Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor, holding it was it was it was eight to one. But Sonia Sotomayor said, "How in the hell y'all gonna have a Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution and not give old folks and people who need resources in Puerto Rico the resources? Are, are they not citizens?" Shout out Sonia. Now I don't know what Kataji Brown Jackson gonna do, but I know one thing: there's at least one person who is a human being on the Supreme Court right now. Well, wow. they would say they would say they get tax breaks. Well, yeah, well, yeah, and they serve in the army, and they ain't got no senators, and they ain't got no Congress people. And I just mentioned her because she too went to Princeton. Okay. So where you go to school uh, don't mean nothing, right. <laughs> and what you study. Because I read Michelle Obama's uh, uh, thesis, undergraduate thesis. It was available on Black folk at Princeton. Good work, but sis, I wake up in a. You first of all, you don't wake up in a in a house built by slaves. You wake up in a house built by Africans who were enslaved. You, wo you woke up in a house built by people. The fact that you even said that. No, let me get me started on Southside. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, let's, get, let's keep going. <laughs> Don't get me started. Because no. what you're is written. in fact, we're going to use a children's book to make that point, Karen. You probably talked to this sister. Right. Oh, maybe I did. But, you know, even in that, I know there's some people who might, you know, they, they, they bristle when you when you go in. Um, I know, I know. And, and and I get it, you know, because for many of us, the representation serves and it does. It serves a need. It serves a need to see ourselves in a place. It serves a need. It validates your humanity. It, it validates says, presidency you know, for sure. But it also says you see, you know, there's this scene in the first lady where, you know, Barack Obama, when he's in the kitchen talking with Michelle and she's saying, you know, you're just, you know, you're a coon, you're an N-word. You know, that's why we have this, um, you know, detail. He's the first, you know, to get the detail before even winning the primary. And, you know, there's this conversation about why are you running? And, that's you know, it's, it's for all of these little black children in this country that they can see somebody in this position. But then the other ultimate question is what is that position what is that position bro do we need to be in that position but that most people are not w w ready to have that conversation dr Carl. and that's why they ain't know we i mean here's a cat who deported more people than any president before him and who set it up so that the cat who came after him who we got stuck with the bill for continued that process here's a cat who uh uh, expanded drone strikes around the world and for the first time uh, said, okay, it's legal. We can kill American citizens on American soil. And I thought citizenship was the thing that you found was inviolate. I ain't, I'm not mad at Barack Obama or Michelle Obama. I understand the social structure. And what I understand is, is what you said. We mistake the politics of demographics and representation as somehow the acquisition of power. This man became the president of the United States. He was not, as he reminded us often, I'm sorry, not when he was running, because again, Barack Obama's a brilliant dude. He knows very well what y'all thought he was going to do. That's why you went out there and voted. But once he get in, it's only so much he could do. And then he's going gonna to pull out the Roosevelt line. Well, you got to force me to do it. Well, that ain't what you say. And then, of course, years later, as Netflix implodes and people eyeballs are roaming all around, you prop up this BS narrative that you was running so that little black children, no, man, you was running because you want to be president of the United States. You must think we all stupid. We're all not stupid. And you must think all we do is watch this stuff. Dude, all you got to do. we, In fact, you know what? Set aside David Garrow's book, Rising Sun, which is a TikTok day by day, damn near from the time he came out of his mama's womb to the day. If you want to read Barack Obama all the way down, Harvard Law School, I mean, you want to read, set aside David Garrow's book, set aside all the books, read Barack Obama's book, Dreams of My Father. And you compare Barack Obama, Audacity of Hope, which he borrows from Jeremiah Wright to that second book. You compare that to Dreams with My Father, which is where I first seen him when he was in Illinois State Senate. And I saw him standing in a field on the south side of Chicago when they were breaking ground for a black theater. And he tagged along with the rest of the uh, delegation from Springfield. You, you, you read him against him. And then come on to this next, this, this, this first volume of this new biography he got. And you, just like O.J. Simpson, it's real simple. You could just read what the man wrote about himself to understand. I'm not mad at Barack Obama at all. I'm not mad at Michelle Obama. I understand how class works in this society. And I understand that blackness is a label and that it can be used for whatever purposes. Uh, it, it, you can use it for any purposes you want if there's a you who to want it. And in this social structure, blackness has been used in a way that benefits the hierarchy so that 
my students and shout out to all the students who are graduating correct all of y'all congratulations my law students we had our last class wednesday night at howard and my undergrads the next day the day for yesterday thursday we had our last class and one of the things they often often say is one of the things we appreciate about class when we're all sitting together is that you don't tell us and like you just said karen you you show us stuff and then we talk to each other and then we all talking together, including you. I said, of course, because we're all experts in ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I am not an expert in you. And you know things I don't know. And, and God knows all that damn money I paid all them years of school. I'm supposed to know stuff y'all don't know. So therefore, together, we all know more than we any of us would have known. And I know that's how you teach your classes. You, for years, you had your students go. This is how you train people to see that the most valuable thing we bring is ourselves. When you talk about bringing our bricks and you make sure that people understand that the brick, the first brick you bring is yourself, then that's what we're doing. So I'm not mad at Barack Obama, Michelle Obama. I'm not mad. At, I don't know them as human beings. I never met Michelle Obama. I met Barack Obama before. Everybody, in fact, I had read that book. In fact, I'm standing there, Charles and Carolyn Grantham, the Comedic Institute people, we stand out there looking. I said, hey, that's that dude whose uh, mother is white and daddy came from Kenya, right? He wrote that book. I read that book. I said, I should have do his hands. I'm like, I'm, he's one of the few ones I recognize. But my point is this. When we think about, no, no, when we think about this question. Bro, Linux would be, um, y'all would have a great conversation. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, you say, no, look, Harry, and you know what? And I, I told you this yesterday. I uh, appreciate Harry Lennox as an artist. I was I was disturbed by his statement, but I'm so happy to hear you narrate how y'all had that conversation because that's your friend. And as you said, we should respect his craft. I mean, look, I thought I was looking forward to him play Duke Ellington. I, he did a hell of a job with Adam Clayton Powell. He was, you know, people talking to the talk, tracing to the five heartbeats generally. And of course, now, I mean, I'm hoping or maybe. Well, I mean, hopefully they'll keep letting him come in Justice League because he's playing John's John. And, you know, we need Uraeus for that because if you know anything about the history of the Justice League and the DC Comics, you know the Martian Manhunter goes back for decades. <laughs> so when you see Harry Lennox as the Martian Manhunter, that ain't nothing they made up for the movies. That goes back to the 50s, you understand? To the to the Cold War, the Red Scare, the whole idea that the Martians were going to invade with Orson Welles in the 1930s. So DC put the Martian Manhunter in that narrative in part because of the fascination with the planet Mars. But who would have thought that he'd have been black? Well, when you see in the, in the DC universe, Harry Lennox shows up at the Martian Manhunter. They're putting a seed. That cat continues in the DC universe. As long as they're making DC movies, he gets paid. So I'm hoping they don't you know, write him out. And, and finally, uh, the biggest role was Barack Obama playing him for eight years. Y'all let that sit. The cadence, the flow, the, the way in which he talks, the, the way in which he walks. That's all South Side of Chicago. Harry Lennox south side of chicago but you know again what's the goal what's the goal let's bring it all back no, no, no. no but that is a very important because whether it be i remember i think i told you this when i was in uh, i had just come out of oh not bridge street bridge street's in dc it'll come to me it's a bookstore right at nyu one of the few used bookstores left i had just come out there i walked the high up a block up to the cafe i'm sitting there eating a turkey burger watching the funeral at uh, at, 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 in, in South Carolina, when uh, Clementa Pinkley and them, yeah, and I saw Barack Obama standing there behind him, all the bishops of the AME church, including our sister who preached last Sunday at chapel, Easter Sunday, she preaches uh, the first woman bishop of the AME church, Vash yeah, Vash yes, um, Vash Tom McKenzie. And I saw when Barack Obama dropped his head. Uh, uh, Amazing, great. I'm eating my turkey burger. When he started singing, I went like. <laughs> and in that, it was almost an involuntary. In that drop was, that is authentic. That is performance. That is aware of your surroundings. That is a moment when you think you can use that blackness to bring the country together and humanize these Africans who have been killed by an overt white nationalist. It's all of it at the same time. Respect the technique. <laughs> That's Barack Obama. So when you say that about Harry Lennox, you can see it. Well, you know, we gotta come in and like, damn, that's 
That's Harry Lennox. <laughs> I, I didn't see it until you said it. And I'm sure everybody in there is just like, Phew. now, the question you got to ask, some people say, well, how do you know? That's easy. There's film of Barack Obama at Harvard. <laughs> Remember he went to Harvard and Derrick Bell, he introduces Derrick Bell at a rally. And they tried to hang him with Derrick Bell, which should be an honor. All you got to do is go back and you can find Barack Obama talking. I'm sorry, talking, or maybe as he would say now, talking. Because <laughs> there ain't no consonants on the ends of their words no more. And Michelle the same way. I mean, you know, she grew up in the South Side, but as you say, Princeton and Harvard, let's be clear. Okay? So, what? but this question of doubling down on Black. People are fascinated by the turkey burger. But go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, oh, I ain't bring my phone in here. Yeah, I mean, I was sitting there eating the turkey burger because I'm just like, I was hungry. I spent all my money on books and I had just enough money to get back to Philly. So, you know, I got let me get, I got enough money. So I just, and somebody said, who is Harry Lennox? All right. That's good. You know, it's like, it's five heart beats. That actually might be the question because if somebody in here probably from from not from the U.S. We you know we are people from all over the world. So if you didn't get the five heartbeats and y'all don't want to get the VPN so that you can jailbreak Netflix, uh -oh. say that. but I mean anyway. So, but this but you know what what happened with this with, with what is, with with double down on black it sent me to I was already looking for children's books. Because Barracoon, and there are a couple of children's books on Barracoon, Professor Hunter, but uh, as we kind of wind up today, the question of what is Black, really, that's why we're reading Barracoon. Because remember, just like the other night when Tanisha came on and, you know, Chief Lewis checked in from uh, Africatown, from Mobile, and, you know, I had tracked down uh, I showed him the uh, the little school badge that they have at Mobile County Training School. That's the Mobile County Training School uh, uh, badge. The Whippets, that's their nickname. As he talked about in them Rosenwald schools, it's still in existence, still goes on. Black folk got a lot of pride in Mobile. I love this because it's got the Greyhound and the Greyhound look like that Greyhound dog on the Greyhound bus line. And I, I used to ride Greyhound bus so much. I don't I didn't like to I don't like to fly. And for years, you know, you know what I'm saying? We got that I'm, not, I'm not a flyer, but we're in good company because Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Mari Evans, Miss Mari, who you know, Aretha. say again, Aretha. No question, it was a whole generation of them. Then, like, in fact, the first time I met Mari Evans, thanks to uh, Marsharika Juwanza and Kamal Juwanza in and out, you know, she lived in Indianapolis, we went over her house, me and Belitia Watkins. We sat with her a long time. I said, Miss Mari, say, you don't like to fly, no, I don't fly either. She'd take a whole train from one side of the country to the other. <laughs> And and I used to be like that too. And I'll get on the Greyhound bus in a minute. In fact, I rode Greyhound so much. At one time, when they had the stores in the Greyhound bus stations, I bought a cap with the uh with the with the dog on it. Because my thing was, if you ride the dog enough, at some point when you get off the dog, they should give you a little medal with the dog. So see, that's an experience. <laughs> this is before Mega Bus and the China Bus on the East Coast. The dog. If you read the, if you rode the dog, y'all got some stories. But anyway. Um, so I'm, you know, in, in in Nubia, that conversation we've been having led us from Martin Luther King to Barracoon because we got to understand who is this we that was created and what can we learn? Can we untether the we from the way we were constructed as labor? Can we overflow the we in terms of the assumptions? So it isn't that the black president didn't do anything for us. Well, it wasn't no us. The us was getting him elected. He knew that. Now, it ain't his fault. If you thought it was something else, I'm not going to attribute any motive to him. I'm sure he would love for the whole world to be different if he could make it different. But he also understands the limitations of the social structure and who didn't understand it was us. And we could have used him a lot more. In fact, it shouldn't matter who the president is. For now, it does. So the whole point is in asking doubling down on black and looking at Barracoon, which began with a conversation we had a few weeks ago between continental Africans. Africans in Europe, Africans in the diaspora of Europe and the United States, Latin America, Caribbean. A conversation, by the way, that none of us would know in this room right now. So I'll share with you that I have every semester at Howard because you have Africans from all over the world at that university, just like at most HBCUs. And this semester in my um, my Introduction to African American Studies class, we had some, I mean, I think about those young people, uh, Ms. Stewart, uh, this young uh, sister, Ms. Garcia, Cuban, Jamaican. 
I mean, it was a different, a lot of West Africans from different places, Ghana, Nigeria, a lot of Africans from other places in the Caribbean, all over the United States. When you throw out a question like, how do we engage in cultural meaning making? What is the history of resistance? To hear an Afro-Cuban talk about Maronage and Marunich, to talk about how her grandmother dealt with plants and herbs, and then talk about how she and her sister were discriminated against because they wanted to take music in a class in Cuba. And for her to say, yes, we are a socialist country, but don't think racism isn't there, it's there. Let me tell you what I experienced. Somebody in their 20s. It reveals the differences, but also the similarities. And to see the lights go on as they realize we're not that different from each other. In fact, we have things we share. That's what led us to Barracoon because we got a 19 year old who was taken out of West Africa and brought to Alabama who lived the rest of his life there. And so all of the elements using him to narrate that are there. So when we ask, we said we're going to double down on black, we have to ask what is black? Well, we know. Then So that's what sent me looking for the children's books. There was one I was looking for in particular. And the one I was looking for in particular is a very rare one. It's a very similar book to Barracoon, except it's fictional, but it was written by a historian using historical moments and using a fictional character. In fact, let me just read what the opening part of this book. This is Walter Rodney's children's book. Some of y'all know the name Walter Rodney, the great Guyanese uh, scholar who uh, was killed, a bomb. They blew him up in 1980, born in 1942, uh, about a month ago. Actually, today's the 23rd, 23rd of March, actually, he was born. 19, uh, 1942. This was his 80th birthday cycle. Kofi Badu of Africa by Walter Rodney. Uh, his most famous book, of course, we know is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. But this is what he says. Oh, wait, you know what? I'll go to the end. He says that. No, 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 no. I'll start at the beginning. The beautiful thing about Kofi Badu of Africa, out of Africa, is that it's like Barracoon, except he's coming from Ghana now. And he talks about Kofi Badu, born in 1652, arrived Guyana, 1698. This was the first of what was supposed to be a five children's book series of how the people of Guyana became Guyana. So it's got artwork. You see he's integrating in the Africans who were there before, the governance structure in Kumasi, the among the Ashanti, the social structure, the uh, dungeons they built, the networks of Africa before colonialism. Because remember, he also wrote a book called A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, where he talks about uh, Walter Rodney's thing was, we were here before them. We had all these societies before them. They exploited us. And so you see all of the pictures, all things. The book isn't long, but let me let me just read this very quickly if I can find it. Because again, looking for this book, it was very important to understand what Walter Rodney was trying to do. He says, um, do, 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 do. when people are described merely as parts of an aggregate, they appear faceless. This is black. My mama is a, my sister. What happened to my, my father? No, nah, y'all all to you, Samuel L. Jackson in school days, you niggas. And you're going to be niggas forever. Just like us. You have one label. Now you can pick nigger, black, negro, whatever, moreno. You could pick the label, but they're only the only options you have to pick from are the ones we gave you. So black. Okay. Well, I don't mean nigger. I, I don't mean nigger. I mean nigger. Like niggas. Niggas like kings. Okay, bruh. Spit your, you know, speak your speech. But we not here, we gonna celebrate and acknowledge the sentiment that you're expressing and ask you why you want to hold on to that word because it doesn't work what you're saying linguistically but the sentiment underneath it that's what we want to keep we need to have a we walter rodney goes on and says again so he's saying when you describe people as an aggregate when you describe them as i, I wake up in the morning to in a house built by slaves slave is one of the limited options you had too that's an aggregate you wake up in a house built by people with names. Do you know the names, Michelle? You Princeton educated, Harvard educated. I know you only had four minutes to get a speech or 10 minutes or 12 minutes to get a speech, but you could have worked in two or three of them names. They exist. You can read my colleague, 
uh, Clarence Luzane's book, The Black History of the White House. You can go back to Benjamin Quarles. Hell, you can go back to the 19th century. Hell, you can go all the way back to William C. Nell, Colored Patriots of the American Revolution in the early 19th century. I mean, or, or, or you don't have to do any of that. You got a staff with a bunch of interns from a lot of different places. And to your credit, you had a lot of HBCU interns working for you, including some of my former students from Howard who worked in the mail room, worked on the staff. Who got, yeah, just throw the question out. I need two or three names of Africans who built the White House. Because I don't want to get up there and say I live in a house built by slaves. Walter Rodney says, when people are described merely as parts of an aggregate, they appear faceless, thereby contributing to a tendency fostered by our oppressors who sought to dehumanize the majority of persons brought as laborers to Guyana, to Memphis, to Port-au-Prince, to Charleston, to Boston, to New York, brought in other words to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Walter Rodney continues, this account seeks to personalize the entry of a single involuntary migrant, Kofi Badu of Asante. Kofi's life history is fictionalized, but it is located within a context of names, dates, episodes, and other references which are authentic. The social settings are accurate, and the circumstances which explain Kofi Badu's departure from his homeland were typical for enslaved Africans. And so he was killed, Rodney. Amos Wilson would call it black on black violence in service of white domination. He was killed because of his political activity in Guyana, working for the working class people. This is a working class historian. This is a working class intellectual. Lived and worked in Tanzania, lived and worked across Africa, lived and worked in the Caribbean, came to the United States, gave lectures here, worked here, taught at the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta. Shout out to my man, Howard Dodson and Andrew Billingsley and all the people who were organized around there and the great Vincent Harding and so many others, Joyce Ladner and, and uh, uh, what's our sister who was the president of Spelman and the president of Bennett, uh, Janetta Cole, all these young people coming through the Institute of Black World sitting with Walter Rodney, Walter Rodney. He was going to, he, he had uh, four more books out of India, out of China, out of Holland, out of Madeira. And then he was going to do another one on the indigenous people of Guyana. And he said, this is what he said. Why are you writing these books? In fact, this is where the editors who finished this, this book was published after he was killed. It was finished before he was killed, but this is what the editor says at the end. He says, although the introduction to this first book written by Walter himself, which I just read from, seems to state only his purpose in writing Kofi Badu, it does in fact state his purpose in writing the entire series, quote, so that the children, at least, might better understand themselves and each other. The children don't know. You got to be taught. You have to be carefully taught, to use the old song. So then I pulled out, I'm looking for children's books, right? Because what we're doing in Barracoon, we're using the life, the real life of Kasula Lewis in a way that Walter Rodney projects to use the fictional life of Kofi Badu. We're going to, now next week, we're going to get into this whole process of enslavement. Black people sold black people in slavery. Slow down. We're going to disaggregate that social structure label that you just read. You heard what Rodney says. When you use those broad concepts, you're serving a system that doesn't see you as human. We're going to humanize this. We're going to use a single life. What this elder told this young person to walk us through, right? So as we're doing that, I'm going to do a couple couple more children's books. Let me get this children's book out because I don't get a chance to, to share that and it hasn't been republished and you know Walter Rodney is known for his other political works if he's known at all and in fact this new book that came out right around his birthday that I couldn't put my hands on the other day when I was showing to Sylvia Winter this is Leo Zelik's book A Revolutionary for Our Times the Walter Rodney story this is Walter Rodney if you want to get a good place to start that isn't written by Rodney this is an excellent book to, to, to get but then I say okay to help the children well let's talk about children's books for a minute because Often, you know, we have this label black. So we, we talk about doubling down on black. Well, is black more than a color? She got the joke. We'll say, yeah, if you're going to take that label and look behind it for the people who the label was given to and look for kind of construct an idea of who those people are to each other, potentially, not in actuality, not in actuality yet. I say, well, you know, let me pull another book. This is a book by Darwin Macbeth Walton, born in Charlotte, North Carolina. Still a lot of the best of my knowledge. Uh, she approached John Johnson in Ebony Magazine, or uh, Johnson Publications. And in 1973, she published, by the way, she was uh, she was the curriculum person for the Maywood, uh, Illinois 
school system. Uh, this is around the time that uh, a young man who grew up in Maywood um, was assassinated by the feds and the damn Chicago police. His name is Fred Hampton. Uh, Fred Hampton, of course, his home, as we saw this week, has been uh, um, extended uh, a historical site, historical preservation status. Um, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. was there, of course, shout out to Fred Hampton Jr., to Mama Najiri, and Jerry, his mother, Fred Hampton's wife. Um, this, this, this public attention was brought, kind of accelerated as a result of the, the film, last year's film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Whatever critiques there are or are not of the film, it, it was made with the participation of the family, the best efforts of the actors and the people who wrote and directed. And we know it's imperfect because it's Hollywood. So you got to have the points of entry and you got to have all that kind of thing. But at least that momentum helped bring attention to the fact that the Save Fred Hampton House campaign was uh, was there and it got accelerated. So they were able to raise that money and, and achieve that status. But anyway, uh, this sister worked in the same town Fred Hampton grew up in and she was the curriculum specialist as a head start. It's called What Color Are You? Darwin Walton. It was and Hal Franklin, the photographer who actually left Ebony shortly thereafter uh, and uh, went and got an MD, medical doctor. There it is. Johnson Publication. She uses publishing company. She uses the students, and I will. I won't. You know, share a lot of. I'll just show you a few of the pictures because she wants to. Talk, what color are you? She said she's children. She said you. You want to teach these children racism? I'm gonna teach something. I'm gonna have pictures. Frankly, I'm gonna take pictures of black children, white children, black and white children together, Asian children, Latino children, Latinx children, as we might say today or not, babies, all kind of color. And she's talking about. She is fascinating. She says, you know, what do all people do? All people sleep, all people eat, all people need shelter. She's saying, okay, so these are things we do together. She says, you know, and then she said, well, what, where does color come from? Well, color is melanin. Then she did a little science in there. She got the epidermal melanin and she's saying that originally we all look like this little boy right here. <laughs> I'm talking about this black boy, right? Because we were near the equator. And as we migrated, we changed why. And they said, well, the dark skinned people needed more protection from the sun. And sunburn, you know, dark skinned people have better protection against sunburn than light skinned people, but everyone can be burned by the sun. Could you explain why? And then she got the people getting sunburned, working out in the car. I mean, it's fascinating. She's got people from all over. And then she, and then this is what I love about it. She's talking about skin shades and how they're different. And then she's got a thing. How did it begin? And she got the Africans there. We all came from there. This is for children, right? So we talk about black. She's helping children get rid of all this. And then she talks about migration. People migrated, skin color, and then now she talks. She starts asking questions about eye color, pigment, and she says, "Now try to imagine all the people you know having the same color of eyes, hair, and skin. That wouldn't be at all exciting. When you meet a new friend, it's much easier to describe him in terms of skin, hair, and eye color. It wouldn't be quite so easy to speak of him, and only in terms of his size and shape." Try describing your best friend or your favorite outfit without using a color to help you. Then she got a little white girl and she's got, I mean, it's fascinating. Then she got a little framework here. Who are you? So you can put your picture in there, right? I mean, she's trying to disaggregate it. Are you Michael, Karen? She got a little Karen in here. Look, there go a little Karen right there. There's a little Karen, right? Michael. Now, you know, Negroes will take black and they may call him, quote unquote, red bone, <laughs> right? You know what? Think of, think of the phrases we use that are inherited from the labels that were put on us. Then she says, no matter what your name may be, it would only be confusing if everybody looked the same. That wouldn't be amusing. She says, great that Bobby is not like Sam, that Bev is not like Sue. You know, they're glad to be themselves, just as you're glad you are you. Mm -hmm. Now... This book would probably be banned today. CRT, because it's CRT, because what you're holding on to isn't a color. You're holding on to an ideology. And what Darren Walton and Hal Franklin were trying to do in 1973 is get these children in a situation where they say, yeah, we're all different. And it's great. Then she asked these questions. This is where I'm in. She said, can color be tasted? Can color be smelled? She's trying to say, this is ridiculous. Can color be heard? I love these pictures. Can color be touched or felt? What is the purpose of a person's skin? Then she goes back to the science. Mm. I'm, I'm loving this. And then at the end, she ends with this. Oh, I'm sorry. Because she is a teacher. She got a glossary in here. She got a little, you know, I mean, she's showing. In other words, this is a workbook. The woman had an head start, right? She was a curriculum specialist. But then she says, 
Think of the beauty and variety that color brings into our lives. It plays such an important part in each of our lives. Whatever shade your skin may be, it protects your body no matter what your color, your shade, or your name. It lets you be you and only you. Whether you're Betty, William, Tanya, Heidi, Claudette, Timothy, or Larry, the same thing is true. What color are you? And she also says here, ain't no such thing as white people or black people. She said, this page you're reading is white. Do you know anybody look like that? She said, the letters on this page are black. Do you know anybody look like that? And then she, I mean, she, I mean, but, but I'm hold saying, up. well, go ahead. Hold the book up again. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What Color Are You by Darwin Walton. Photographs Hal Franklin. Two black folk, black photographer, black. Oh, yeah. And I love, and thank you, because I showed it back. Johnson Publishing Company, Incorporated, Chicago. And some of y'all remember Ebony Jr. An Ebony Jr. book. That's right. I mean, but you know what? We have Nubia now. And we got the black publishers in here. So we could do. <laughs> but even, even showing that makes me sad. Mm. At the same time, because John Johnson had the exact same vision. Yes, he did. He was building institutional knowledge. He had Laron Bennett. He was creating, you know, institutions, had that building. You know, the fact that all of that was going to be lost. Uh, <laughs> shout out to, to the brother in Chicago that has, you know, the collection in the library and the, you know, the building there. Yeah, my friend, the Gates. Yeah, yes. the Gates. But, you know. I'm just saying we keep having to start over again. There was, you know, that what Johnson did should have been built upon. What no Carter question. G it will be built should have been built upon. We got, you know, of course, the Schomburg. We're going to build it. I know. I know. But it's just like, damn. No, I know. It makes All you it makes you mad as hell. And again, I ain't mad at this cat. I'm going to show you his books again just because. This is a white scholar out of England, E. James West, Ebony Magazine, and Lerone Bennett Jr., Popular Black History and Post-War America. It's a great book. It's also published by the University of Illinois Press. I'm sorry, brother. This book just came out. You talk about the building. This is the book on the building. There's the building on the cover. There's the building Johnson Publications built for black people. It's called A House for the Struggle. The black, except it ain't there no more owned by black people. It's not published in Ebony, and it's the University of Illinois Press. I don't give a damn about these damn white university presses. After black people have struggled to build institutions, you wait a generation or two, you go you go ruffling through the scraps in the archive. People love the archive. Now, I know some of you Negroes archive lovers, so I'm going to say a little less. Because archive is very important. I understand the most important archive is the living archive. Do you know how many people who worked in that building still walking around? And people, I'm, I'm, I love when, when academics say this. I'm working on this. I'm working on this. I'm working on the Johnson. You're working on it. Why aren't you working for working with the thrust to the point you read? But guess what? Not mad at you. Great work. You see, I got it. You see, I read it. It's important. But that ain't what we doing. What y'all doing? Well, we like the Chinese. We pouring clean glasses of water over here. And one day you might want to come over here and work with us. But guess what? We're not chasing you because everybody here is supposed to be here. And as COVID cleared out all the things, the people who are here now, and who will continue to come. We've been coming together with Barry Coon and reading and discussing and having these comments and then being infused with action steps That because study is action too. Let's not mistake that. But all of it is building in due time. And, 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 and Professor Hunter, we will recover the momentum of memory. We will recover the momentum of Johnson Publications and the momentum that Arturo Schomburg as he, as he collected those pieces. And we're gonna connect with people who would love nothing more than to do this, but you know, just a little afraid right now because they can't, you know, they think the ice ain't thick enough or they don't trust the land. And they, okay, it's okay because it's coming. But understand when you come, you're coming here, you're not bringing that. <laughs> you understand because we've seen this show before. They would take that. I mean, hell, look, man, I'm telling you, they'll take it and write about it now that it is safe, as Carl Anthony Snick said of Martin Luther King, let us praise him now that he is safely dead. In other words, <laughs> if the institution is dead, oh, we'll write about it all day. In fact, we will give each other awards. But this is where I wanted to, to go because I know we don't want to. You know, go ahead. You about to say something. I was just going to, you know, not only did the Johnson Library end up, and thank God for a Black man to recover it, but I think about Toni Morrison's 1,200 books, she ain't even got the 50,000 you had, but her 1,200 book personal collection went to auction. No question. Some, and, and no and question. It's some white man's house, $4.75 million. Oh, oh, that ain't even. That, hurt, that hurts me so much. Ooh, but that okay. hurts. 
it's okay because Toni Morrison, who is so important, Toni Morrison, who is a giant, Toni Morrison will be the first to say that her collection paled in comparison to the collective collections that our people have in basements and living rooms and attics. And all we have to do, and I'm not saying don't give your stuff to the Schomburg or the Talladega or Howard, but I'm saying if you had the choice between those places and a place or places, as we talked about on Monday night, we talked about that. We see the Wara Johnson collection in Opobo that Ayafubar is heading up. We see the collection, I've seen a collection in Accra, in Ghana. We need these places all over, places, and they're not places that then are exclusive. In other words, to write books like that, or most of these books, you got to have time off, you get fellowships, people talking about, my thing is, yeah, we have our own fellowships. We, we subsidize our own scholars. We need a place, as Mariba Kelsey, uh, Bob Mariba was saying the other day at the ASCAP conference. He's the head of the ASCAP Building Fund. He said, I am amazed at the amount of work our institution builders have done on nights and weekends away from the job where they had to pay their bills. He said, now, if we had a few places where that's all we did, imagine. And guess what? We had those. That's what Johnson was. But this is the thing. And that's what this voice that, that you know, Walter Roddy's writing this for the school children of Guyana. It's a form of barracoon for those children. This is what uh, uh, um, Darren Walton and Hal Franklin were doing for children of all backgrounds. Now, let's wind this. Children have to double down on black. We said, we said, we said, that's why we have to double down. On that's us. why we have to double down. But, but the black we have to double down on has to be the black we want. Not the black we inherited from a social structure that loves that black. Because right. now they figure, you know, you, you can put a few black, little black earring on it and put a little African word in it. Hell, you can even make up an African country called Wakanda and make a billion dollars twice because Negroes went and saw it three times. In other words, that's cool. We like that black. Wait, what y'all doing? We're going to make our own film. Oh, hell no. 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 Okay, well, okay, we'll make, we'll make a series with you. Okay, wait, that's too black, Misha. The hell you doing? Cancel. In other words, don't get so close to the thing that you're going to upset the hierarchy. We'll even hire 15 or 20 of you Negroes. We'll give you sketch shows. We'll get all the, we, we, we'll give you whatever the hell you want. And it'll be clever. And y'all sit in the dark and watch it at midnight or watch it when it come on regular broadcast network and laugh and chuckle. And we laugh and chuckle too, all the way to the bank. And now you feel fulfilled culturally. Yes, it's, it's fulfilling. And you look up and say, okay, well, let me go and get dressed, go to work. Why? Because you could have done that for yourself and kept those resources. This is what Shake Out the Joke tried to tell y'all. But wait, hold on. Uh, so Tanya, shout out, uh, she shared this on the air. So she's in this series called uh, Run the World, right? Mm. Uh, right. And so she showed up for the table read. The woman that created it and wrote it, she was like, where, where is so-and-so? Oh, yeah, she uh, basically got bought out. They kicked off her own show. I was like, what? what? I only, you know, like, black woman created this thing, made that deal. She's in Oregon somewhere. I'm like, so now she's like, yeah, it's, it's going to be a different show this, this year. Well, of course. Of course. I mean, you can't, I mean, look, you can't be mad. I'm sure, I don't know, some of y'all may have seen this book. It's called uh, Bad and Bougie. <laughs> Bad and Bougie was about Black Women and Feminism is published by, uh, I think, a Christian publishing company. And it was a white woman who wrote it. Black people were furious. And I'm like, hold on now. Hold on now. You live in the pet store. And you mad because the owner put this other pet in front of you at the pet store. You live at the pet. And, hold on. Or y'all come to Nubia. Why y'all mad? I understand why you mad. I do. I don't feel any of your anger. In fact, I'm looking at y'all the same way I looked at Barack Obama that day. He was singing that song. I just, <laughs> in other words, <laughs> bruh, because guess what? While you singing and while we all standing up and cheering, did Dylan Roof get executed yet? Last I checked, Kyle Rittenhouse, a more recent Dylan Roof, got in his car in one state, drove to another state, started killing white folks. <laughs> Not guilty. Y'all try to put a whole white woman cop on trip, and, and the Asian lady was like, I understand she's guilty, but I'm gonna give you 15 seconds. Go with God. <laughs> yeah. And she, in Buffalo, they knocked a whole white man down, broke his skull, and got away with it. Y'all gonna y'all gonna find out about these paddle rollers. 
Jay Dilla tried to tell y'all in his remix of F the Police. Yeah, F them. <laughs> we got enough of them. Then you got them mistake cops. Them huh, thought he had a gun. Blow. Made a mistake cops. I hate cops. I'm some of y'all police. Well, you know what? Get your brothers together and check out some kind of blue thing. But this here, um, thinking about what it means to double down on black. I saw an interview on Good Morning America. I don't know. Have you interviewed this sister, Shelly Williams? I know Tanya know who she is because she. Absolutely. Uh, yes, I absolutely. You know her, right? Do you know this book? Yeah, I have. Yes. And she's a Broadway person, too. Shelly Williams. Love it. She did The Wiz. She coming yeah. back with the quiz. I think she's coming back with her. She's a dog. Yeah, hidden she's figures. She about to do hidden figures. Yeah. Yes. No question. Aida. I mean, I saw her on yes. Good Morning. I should have asked. No, I should have asked you. I, I I I saw her on Good Morning America about six uh months ago. And I don't watch Good Morning America. I saw the clip. So immediately I went down to the uh to San Kofa because they have one of the greatest children's book sections in the country. And I said, Y'all got and they had it, your legacy. You know what I love about this book. And she said it in the interview. Did, wait, wait, let me, come on back, come on back. Tell me, did y'all so, y'all y'all talked about the book? If y'all talked about the book, yes, I'm about to actually drop my interview with her. In oh, wonderful! The, Would you please? Back in October, we talked uh, October 2021 because she also uh, produced Aida, um, The Wiz. She's coming. She, she's dope. Now, see, that's the kind of black person when you see her, you can tr you can you can double down on that black because she's not there just to advance herself. This is what we're talking about. If you see me, you see us. And she said, my children. Oh, I love the way she said she said I had never once imagined that those enslaved people were fluent in their own languages. I just thought they were ignorant and spoke broken English as a child. When she says in this book, I did not want to have. A conversation about slavery. I want to have a conversation about our enslaved ancestors. I, I never forget. I, I, I never forget the fact that I wake up in a house built by slaves. With that, Shelly Williams said, "I don't have no conversation about slavery because growing up, I was ashamed." Because you shouldn't be ashamed. No. Well, how else could I be ashamed? I mean, y'all been fighting this for years. When they talk about Black people, they ain't got no clothes on. They can't talk. And I think, oh, that's me. And everybody looking at me now. Why? Because it ain't skin color. It ain't just skin. That's black. That's why black people say, I don't want to see no more damn slavery movies. I get it. I understand. I barely sat through 12 years of slave one time. Because I'm tired of <laughs> see that shit i don't want to see it what wow, these are human beings so when i said okay and you know what all due respect i don't want to see no more books that end with american flags and that's why we're all together you can tell that story without being hyper patriotic and tying all that to a flag go back in the archives since you love the archives so damn much and go get something that came out of a black institution that is dealing with race and not just dealing with black people, but you're not tying it to this imaginary white nationalist flag. Do you understand you're playing into the hands of the Steve Bannons and the Marjorie Taylor Greens? Do you understand that you cannot redeem that? I, I live in a house built by slaves. Them slain people told the British how to burn the damn place, but you can't say that. Why? Because you're running for office. We get it. You're in a social structure. We'll even put you in there if you're going to help, but you're not really going to help. And then you're going to run around the country and tell black men to pull their pants up. With an accent you jack Harry Lennox for? Hell out of here. So Shelly Williams says that she wanted to have a conversation that anchored us. And so what I love about this book is the narrative frame. Look at this. This is the first thing she say. Your story begins in Africa. Your African ancestors defied the eyes and survived 400 years of slavery in America and passed down an extraordinary legacy to you. Pause. Pause. Hey, all you people that hate CRT, this is the book you should be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. Not born on the water, not 1619. Why? Because that book is still facing the dates and the historical narrative of the oppressors. You want in. Now, you want the place to be different. You want the place to be better. We all do. Absolutely. But you're tethering it to 
the victories of a settler enterprise. Walter Rodney is like, are you crazy? Shelly Williams ain't say, are you crazy? She ain't got to say, are you crazy? She just started the book for children and say, yo, story begins in Africa. Okay. White people say, well, where am I? <laughs> your story begins in Africa too. But uh, <laughs> but she's talking now to us. This is a governance structure book. A governance structure book that is published by Abrams Books for Young Readers. Shout out to Shelly and Tanya Engel. Let's go through it right quick. And we wind up with this. Did you know Africans were the first people on the earth. Africa is a continent that is home to many countries and many thriving nations. For thousands of years, Africans cultivated their land and grew many kingdoms that were passed down from generation to generation. They dreamt of the day their land would be passed down to you. Cole Howard, French, that last line, she summarized there for children, the intellectual thrust of born in blackness with the changes and challenges that Tanya, you are forcing us to consider and have to reintegrate in the in the in the spirit of shake out the joke. But that last line, they dreamt of the day that their land would be passed down to you. All due respect to a sister born this month, August, I mean April the fourth, Margarita Johnson, who changed her name to Maya Angelou. But I am not, and you are not, unless you talking about this, the hope and the dream of the slave. I'm sorry, Katanji. The hope of the dream of the slave was not to sit on the Supreme Court. Some of the hope of the dream of the slave was to cut the throats of their oppressors and to go home. Because Sula Lewis's dream to the day he died was to go back home. Which is why in Barracoon there's a photograph of him with no shoes on and you can't see the feet. And Zornel Hurston writes in there, he said, I'm gonna, can I take your picture? He said, yeah, he's trusting her now. Okay, well, hold on a minute. Let me take my shoes off. Why? Because when I take my shoes off and my feet hit the dirt, I imagine I'm at home in Africa. African land, as he say. This man been here for decades. This is the 1930s. He was brought here in 1859. Let me take my shoes off. Well, I never, never stopped. If I can't go back to Africa, then damn it, I'll make Lansing my Africa. If I can't go back to Africa, I'll make Mobile my Africa. If I can't go back to Africa where I am, my community my Africa, you're going to double down on black, double down on that, double down on community, double down on us first. And this, this lady says, they dreamt of the day. This sister says, they dreamt of the day their land will be passed on to you. That is the hope and the dream of the human being. Hope and the dream of a slave. Then she goes through and she gives some language words for greeting. Yambo, assalamu alaikum, saubona, which means West Africa, Islam, all over Africa, Southern Africa. Then she says, now she got 1619 in here. In the summer of 1619, ships from Europe arrived on the shores of Africa. European slave traders had come to take African people away. Although your ancestors did not want to leave their homes, they had no choice. The language, you see that? Africa. Africans are the center. All the people were taken and put on ships for a very long journey. They had no idea where they were going, but they feared what life was going to be like in this new place. But your ancestors were determined to survive. This is a children's book. You can read the children, y'all. I'm very serious about that. Think about my brother, Dr. Daniel Black at Clark Atlanta, his book, The Coming. The Coming. It was The Coming that was bad, echoing the poem from Sonia Sanchez, his dissertation advisor at Temple University. Although they were strangers, okay, black people are not the same, black community is not a monolith, all good. Although they were strangers on that boat, they chose to love and protect one another as family. Look at that, look at that. But now, now his thing gonna blow your mind, all right? You see that love? We're gonna see that again in a second. You know what that makes me think about? This page right here, James Baldwin. James Baldwin who said, I cannot remember the first time I was taken away from my mother as an infant. But I'm sure I cried. I was told I cried, I cried, I cried. He says, I do not remember, but I love my mother. And he says, love helps you. Love helps you remember what you can't remember. So these Africans would get, read all of the Equiano. Equiano was like, when, I, when they put me on that boat, I ain't know these people. And this, and this older man came to me. I was a child. He said, you're my boat brother. I'm going to take care of you. Double down on that. The black community is like, shut up. Shut your mouth if you don't, if you're using the oppressor's definition. Reparations should be for lineage of people who were enslaved here. I mean, the mind of the slave is a remarkable thing to understand how it was created. 
First of all, I don't give a damn if you ever get reparations in that. Of course, we want reparations. Of course, we are owed reparations. But that is assuming, like Harry Lennox might assume of the Academy Awards or the Motion Picture Arts and Academy, that they have morals. You can only make a demand from a position of power. If you're in a pet store begging, then expect to get what your power will get for you. Nothing. Okay. They needed to find a way to communicate with each other. It was their intellect that allowed them to combine all the languages they spoke to create a new one called Pigeon. They also found a new language they could share, music. Now you see these Africans, these ain't beat down. These ain't, yes, they were ass whoopings. Yes, but guess what? They were talking to each other. They took them raggedy ass languages called French, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, and English and converted them into Ebonics forms of mute. And they took their cultures and blended them. Reblending, read Robert Ferris Thompson, read Grendel Menlo Hall, read Sterling Stuckey, understand how our cultures were developed. This is a book for children, y'all. And then some enslaved people escaping means secretly learning to read and write in English. They were illiterate. No, they couldn't read and write English. That's silly ass language. You know, the one with all the one syllable words, fist, heart, stick, gun, knife. The ones where the words are in English, but you think they ain't words. They're really long words from the French. Sneaking food and spices from the kitchen to cook something special or smuggling messages to someone they love. Their actions were important for every act of defiance was empowering and courageous. There's another word. You got intellect. You got love. You got courage. Oh, we going somewhere. Sometimes escaping meant running away. Your ancestors wanted to be free again and to be reunited with their families more than anything. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. The dream and the hope of the slave was be reunited. Read Heather and uh, Andrea Williams' book uh, to find my people. Coming out of the Civil War, black people walking all over the damn country looking for each other. We call each other. I don't care. You call each other. This is my cousin on you, the West Coast. What's up, cuz? Cuz. These are words that came out of English language, but they were transformed by the cultures of Africa. We all kin. And then people say all skin folk ain't kin folk. That is a clear articulation of the differences between a blackness, the social structure put on you, skin folk, and the ways that you double down on the blackness you created for yourself, kin folk. All skin folk ain't kin folk. It was your ancestors' determination to survive that drove them to keep seeking ways to escape slavery, even though it was dangerous. There's another word, determination. Oh, then she talked Harriet Tubman, Henry Box Brown, William and Ellen Craft, Fred Douglas, Robert Small. She's talking about these black people who are using, but she ain't tied it to no damn red, white, and blue, no social structure. She's tied it to those words we just saw. Oh, your ancestors were brilliant. They had been in all kind of amazing things. Then she drop a few inventors on you. Wait a minute, Professor Hunter. Let's pause at brilliance for a minute. What? Look I think at that. There was somebody's uh, birthday today you wanted well, to mention. I, actually was gonna, I was gonna start with it because I was like, yeah, uh, but then we, I was like, well, let's just end here. And then you found a way to bring it back. And I promise y'all. Yeah, yeah, we found a way to bring it back. <laughs> so on this day, on this day, April 23rd, 1856, Granville Taylor Woods, Granville T. Woods was born. Yeah. Um, and I think about anybody that rides a subway, mm. none of that was available because what he, his technology, self-taught man that had to drop out of school because his parents didn't have money. Um, you see number two, Granville T. Woods. Granville T. Well, Woods. If you ride, if you ride, if you ride the subway, why must we thank Grandpa Woods? Professor uh, because Hunter? he created the the third rail, the mechanical, electrical. He was an engineer uh, that that worked on trains and streetcars. Matter of fact, they called him the Black Edison, but Edison, of course, we all know, uh, borrowed and stole from folk. Uh, he was not right. a genius, but he was a great marketer, and he was able to take other people's inventions. And Grandpa T. Woods actually gave much of his, or sold much of his, to GE. So a lot of that General Electric's technology, that's Granville Woods um, and other major technology companies. And it goes back to what you were just talking about, Dr. Carr, in terms of us selling our great. He had 50 patents. He invented automatic brake. He uh, he had a yeah, that's one she talking about right here. She's got the automatic brake. She got another page called Strength Ingenuity, where she goes down about eight of them. And number two is the automatic brake for trains, Granville T. Woods. Yeah, it's a children's book, y'all. Anyway, go ahead. So, so about I mean, 50, 50, you should have more. 50 I inventions that we know of, but I think about this man who basically died penniless. Who Come on was, now. Was an unmarked grave. We talked about unmarked graves before when we did the Aunt Jemima discussion. 
uh, that somebody had to unearth and put him in a. I think about that. Somebody that to the to this day, if you ride the subway, that technology is directly that man. Phonographs, telegraphs. That's him. Not this. The old right here, the brother who was also put employed by Edison, the great Louis Lab. Well, Latter, Latter. Yeah. No question. No question. But not not household names. Not household names. No. You not, know? No. No. You know. But I mean, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, you know, they may have taken a check, sold their inventions, but it wasn't worth much, you know, because to die penniless in an unmarked grave tells you everything you need to know about this social no. structure. That's right. And look, we all got to die, but guess what? Your grave ain't got to stay unmarked. We talked about it the first night. We talked, in fact, you talked about it when we were talking with uh with Tracy. uh Tracy. With, yeah, Tracy, yeah. Was Walker been, found that gravestone. That's right. And in fact, I, while I was looking for those other books uh, that I was looking for, I found Deborah Plant's two books, who, uh, of course, is the editor for Barry Coon. She did two books on Zora Neale Hurston, an anthology, and then she did a, a full bio. I got them in the other room. So we're going to talk about this Monday night. I'm telling y'all, if y'all ain't in Nubia. <laughs> but let's let let's finish up because this is an outlier children's book. Let me just say that as well. As brilliant as uh, Shelley Williams's book is, and she says it came from me. Feeling ashamed whenever and I, and I think to myself, oh man, sis, I wish someone had been around you who knew the children's books that were being written when you were a little girl, because we've always written those children's books. We got children's book going back to the 19th century in the United States, and when I tell you that this isn't an outlier, please understand. If you're gonna pick a children's book, you gotta pick a book like this. So here we end up. Now she goes back. She's told the story. Then she says, your ancestors never forgot who they were and where they came from. Let me tell you what that would do to a five or six year old. The founding fathers were founding fathers. Hmm. Oh, you know where I'm from, Africa? No, I'm talking about George Washington. You're not my dad. I read this little book. Says, your ancestors never forgot where they from. And then said they walked with grace and dignity. Their names match the many gifts. They had given to and she got black women. Oh man, I'm gonna tell you right now. Tanya Engel put her foot in this. Two black women. Tanya Engel was the illustrator. Oh, look at the colors, too. I mean, the color. Then she goes, Grace and Dignity. Now, now we're done, except love. Now she bringing it up. Black couples, black determination and courage. Now you can talk about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Why? Because you decentered whiteness. Brilliance, dignity, intellect, strength. Oh, she gave Barack a little bone. Got to give him one, right? But there's Mary Bethune and Shirley Chisholm and Mae Jemison, who also majored in Africana studies, by the way. A scientist who double major. One of them was Africana studies. Ingenuity, grace. Got Cal Basie in there. The great Joe Baker, Josephine Baker, Miles Davis, Rita Franklin, Misty Copeland, Mary Anderson, Alvin Ailey, Ella Fitzgerald, born April 29th. Your ancestors passed down. Look at that picture. Where's the flag? Where's the damn flag? I'm gonna show you the flag. I'll show you the flag. Walter Rodney show you the damn flag. They got the damn flag. That's them flags that we be taught to worship, right? But on the other page, at the last page, he show you the flags we should be looking for. We're gonna end up with a damn flag. Everybody, calm down. You start with your roots, and you are the trees. And she says your ancestors passed down the best of themselves. That is your legacy. All those years ago, they endured so that you wouldn't have to. They fought for their freedom and yours. Now, if you're talking about I and the hope and dreaming of a slave, okay, I'll go with you that way far down. But don't be quoting that stand up with, surrounded by white people saying the dream. Nah, that wasn't the dream. The dream was their freedom and yours. Freedom, not subservience. They knew that freedom was the first step to equality. They have given you all the tools you need to grow the hearts and minds of this nation. Oh, wait. Oh, damn. She drove it in a ditch. Hearts and minds of this nation. No, she didn't. Oh, she says, they have given you all the tools you need to grow the hearts and minds of this. No, every nation. Every nation. You white nationalists and you black face white nationalists and you unassuming black face white nationalists of every country that will pick the flag of your oppressor over each other. 
get your damn mind right. Equality is the gift you will pass down to the next generation. You will pass. And then she says, okay. Mm. Now take a deep breath. She's talking to me. Now take a deep breath. Close your eyes. And receive your ancestors. There go the words. Love, intellect, determination, courage, brilliance, strength, ingenuity, grace, and dignity. They are a part of you. Honor them and their sacrifices. Walk tall, hold your head high, change the world. You are meant to do great things. They sitting out there in front of Dr. King, right? A statue, by the way, by a Chinese sculptor. Come on, black people. Another birthday today, my man, my good friend and brother, the formerly uh, pro, uh, associate provost at Cornell University, director of the African State Center at Cornell, and the historian of Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, this is volume two of the Alpha History, written by my good friend and brother, uh, Robert Harris, 79 years old today. That's volume two. Volume one was, of course, Charles Wesley. But last picture in the book, children playing on the swing, the ancestors. So look, y'all, if you're going to double down on black, <laughs> make sure you know what black you're talking about. <laughs> so let's just pause there right there. One minor correction, Ella Fitzgerald. Oh was born April 25th, the day 25th, after. 25th, my bad. Is Duke Ellington on the 29th? Ellington, I was going to say yeah. Duke Ellington is the 29th, uh, August Wilson's the 27th, which happens to also be uh, a, your birthday. I oh, believe. but uh, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah, it's the 24th. Tomorrow's the 24th. What's the yep. 24th? Uh, a bunch 24th? of people my birthday is my birthday. Oh, it's your birthday. Okay. So we all, yeah, because yesterday was Charlie Mingus's birthday, and I played Fable of Fathers all day while I'm out there grading paper or something. And today is uh, Robert Harris' birthday. Tomorrow is your birthday. Uh, Ella is the, the 25th. 25th. Yeah. And then yeah. we got Coretta Scott King, Hubert Harrison, um, uh, oh man, on the 27th, and August Wilson, as you say, and Duke Ellington on the 29th. But you know the beautiful thing about it is, I just go back. Maybe I end with this. I, I and don't go anywhere. I'm just right quick. As Darwin Walton, I'm sure I can hear that echo. Given the theme of the book, we all got birthdays. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing. So in celebrating your birthday, my birthday, all our birthdays, we know that that's just a proxy for everybody's birthday. Happy birthday to you! Thank and you. on Monday night, we'll continue in Africa Town. I'm going to talk a little bit about this is a pamphlet that was done years ago in Milwaukee on Africatown. You see the quote at the bottom is Marcus Garvey. And, and there's a quote in here that I'm going to read on Monday from a sister who is part of this reparations thing and arguing for lineage. And it's kind of unfortunate, but it's all good. But if you're not a Nubia, you know, you won't know about that. But uh, yeah, and for and Nubians, we going from part one through part seven on, of Barracoon on Monday night. So. Let's get rid and, of and let me just say this. Um, I would have voted for Barack Obama knowing everything that I know uh, sure. again. Sure. Because because that's the that's really the, the nimbleness of blackness is that we need to keep our eye on the ball too. Sometimes that's, you yeah. do things for strategy. Some most of the time, all of the time, we should be doing things that benefit us in the long run and then apply pressure to these levers of power to get the things that we need to get done. It's all no, strategy and only get there I, together. I agree. We have to. In fact, I'm glad you said that because I would too. And I know a lot of my <laughs> friends who consider themselves on the left or radicals. Let me just remind you that um, unless you have completely delinked from the system we live in, you're growing your own food, you're supporting yourself, then you live in a system where we have to negotiate. And it, many of my friends who would say, you know, we have to be more radical. I agree. They are well compensated for their labor uh, they own their homes uh they you know and they talk all this to, and they write wonderful books in white presses and discuss radicalism with each other and meanwhile right down the street from where they're having these wonderful conferences in places like new haven and new york city and places like cambridge massachusetts and berkeley california there are people who didn't eat today so if there's a hell below we all gonna go and you better pray to god and all that radical talk you giving if it didn't put a morsel of food in the belly and say, well, Obama didn't feed anybody. Well, we should have broke him the way that we would have broke Donald Trump. That's on us. 
It shouldn't matter who the president is. But yeah, we thought that we put Obama in, there would be a little bit something different. And guess what? He started out with a few things that would have been better than the policy decisions other people made, but we didn't press him. And there's only so far these limits will be. These limits, the, there are limits to the social structure. So this isn't a Barack Obama campaign. God only knows. God knows. In fact, I don't know Barack Obama and I probably wouldn't, I don't know whether I'll ever meet him or not, but. Well, you met him once. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. When I shook his hand, right. He was real quiet that day. Because again, when you around a bunch of black people, that's who you see who the black people, who white people think are black people are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's one thing. I know you've been, look, I can't even imagine the stories you got about the people who white people think are super black and then they be in the room with a bunch of black people and that's when you find out, oh. I got stories about black people who think black people are super black. Who How get in the room that? with white people and cower and you know they talk a good game in person uh i could write a whole book on the number of black people which is why i i have to do the things that i'm doing because a lot of us some of our favorite people when they get in those rooms sell us out as quickly as you couldn't even imagine they don't stand up for anything they don't fight for anything that 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 would actually free us but yet they have all of the fire and smoke on the airwaves. And that's the other thing we need to keep our eye on. That's the other thing. As we double down on black, let's really look at who's really doing that work. No question. And that's not to say less, but y'all well, pay attention. In the following week, I hope you take at least five minutes to sit still and be with your people. Well, Sam Reynolds said, you know, on, on that eclipse day, I need to be in some salt water. So I made a commitment, Dr. Carr, I'm going to be in some, somebody's ocean on April 30th, get, get, getting all of that power from the universe and uh, watch what happens next. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, and I hope you do the same on the 27th. On the 27th, the only people I've been talking about. Wait, look, as soon as I threw it back at you, you're like, well, um. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, 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 I, I won't be in no, near no water, I don't think, but I know I'm going to be talking to my mother and father who I would normally call or uh, physically and thank them for having me. But now, like you, at least with your father, I, you know, thank them ancestrally. And so I'll be with them and I'll be somewhere sitting there because, you know, we're in grading season. So I work so that that day I don't do nothing for nobody else. So if it hadn't been for COVID, I would be somewhere hunting for books. But, you know, we're the message we're giving to me, I'm going to give it to you because I know we're similarly wired. For those people, yeah. happy, thank you for all the happy birthday wishes. Both of us are similar. We we, we appreciate it. Well, we we good. Most of the time, we're probably not even thinking about our birthdays, which I'm no. not. But, you no. know, I recognize that people want to recognize it. So I, no. I have to see that. But I'm also <laughs> going to go to you. Um, in fact, I should, I should mention, I should mention, uh, I would put up usually an April birthday when, when, when this was years ago, when I was teaching at Temple, even Ohio State, I would make a photocopy of a face of somebody who was born in April. And if I had to teach on my birthday, I would put it on the blackboard and I would say, anyone who could tell me who that is, their birthday is this month. If you can tell me who that is, I'll give you an A for the rest of the semester and you ain't got it. We're on quarters at Ohio State, A a quarter. Yeah. And they can never get it. I can't do that today because they all got Google. So, yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> I mean, one time I did William Monroe Trotter because the thing I loved about that was they would come with all kind of Trotter was born in April the 7th. Uh, William Monroe Trotter, of course, black press. They looked at William Monroe Trotter, man. And of course, I had some white students at Temple. So is that Martin Luther King? Is that a different picture? I never seen that picture. <laughs> Anyway, I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah, we don't think about our birthdays. Yeah, we don't. We don't. I'm grateful to be here, but um, I'm grateful every single day. And, you know, I, I but I, we have to both learn to be appreciated in a way that nourishes the community. And that was the message that I have. And I know you're avoiding this, but you also have to double down on yourself and, oh, yeah, and no you know, take care of yourself in a way that you might not be inclined to because I'm not inclined to. So I'm sharing that too. So we got to double down on ourselves too, Dr. Carr. I, I, I doubled down. In fact, I doubled down. I, 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 All right. I, I did. And I didn't do the unboxing. And I don't know what I did with the doggone book. I had, Oh, here it is. I, um, you know, you swan, they stopped making smart exhibition catalogs. And this is one of the few I didn't have. This is from February 25th, 2010. And I found it. I found it. So I got this. I, I got this copy a couple of days ago. And I'm going to show y'all one little picture. You talk about doubling down on black. This is a picture from the Universal Negro Improvement Association, 1921. 
an album in print. I'm sure it was it, the original, the starting bid was two thousand dollars to three thousand dollars. But look at the picture because they colored in the red. Black. This is the Black Cross nurses, and see that red, black, and green flag. Oh, look, double down on black, y'all. Yes, double down on black, like these sisters right here from Jamaica and Barbados and New York and Georgia and North Carolina. You black people not together. We know. Shut up. Just look at the picture. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you know, because your grandmama in this picture right here, your great grandmother, your auntie is in that picture right there. This is what Shelly Williams is writing about. This is your legacy. And get y'all children this book, but get it from a black bookstore. Don't give Amazon no damn money. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Stay Kofa online and y'all can go to uh, narrative.com in yes. the resources. We got like 300 black bookstores, find your yeah. city, you know, so let's support, let's support. And uh, Dr. Carr, love you. I'll love see you too. on Monday. All love right. You Nubia, you. <laughs> Nubia, oh wait, tomorrow. Maroon. Tomorrow's Maroon's Medicine Chest. I think Dr. Senyata has something special planned. So you want to... Uh, Oh, yeah, you better have something. I'll be in there for the let me, let me say less. Let me say less. And then Tuesday, Dr. Beatty. Uh, Dr. see, I know I know Mario Beatty. So school now with classes over. So everybody taking meta nature, just get ready because he ain't and got your birthday. This is your birthday, so we all going we all gonna sit in that power. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Uncle Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Love you guys. See y'all in the Nubian streets. <laughs>